Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. Why is it special? Because we don't know what the f*** we're doing. How about that? Did I cuss too early for YouTube, <laughs> my co-host? And joining me in this journey through hysteria as we fly by the seat of our pants and pull it straight out of our ass, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. I believe I did say last week that he is the world's most remarkable mark. Your friend and mine, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. Hey, pleasure to be here once again for whatever it is that we're going to do on this week. Oh. It's, it's even a mystery to me this week. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, I told you I don't know what we're doing, so just follow me. Uh, it's one of the, we're, we're recording on a different day. It's uh, nothing that the people should be upset about. You might actually hear the program on the day you normally do, but we have internal scheduling conflicts in the Cornet Arcadian Vanguard empire. And uh, so we're recording at a different time. And I was so just disappointed by the, product that was foisted upon the unsuspecting wrestling public this week on television. We're going to talk about some of it, but not at length today on the program. We're going to turn it over to the people, the cult of Cornette. I, you know, and I told you this, Brian, last, I told you this, uh, what, uh, yesterday, whatever day that was, I said, I don't know what we're going to talk about. I'm going to go look for some things that the people are talking about or wanting to know about, or wanting to hear us talk about. And we're going to, I'm going to go through some emails and we're going to get some hot topics. And we also, uh, since they won't help us out with our wrestling fix on the modern programs, we're going to do a watch along today, right? What major event is this coming from that we're going to watch? Well, it's a Scott Hall match, but Razor Ramon against Bret Hart. Uh, from what was it? Royal Rumble 1993. Royal Rumble just just barely months before I showed up on in in the scene there. But um, that's why he smiles during the match. Yes, they, they didn't know what was fixing to happen to him later on that summer. But we're going to watch that not only in obviously this being a week where everybody's remembering Scott Hall, but also to see some good wrestling at least at some point. <laughs> and folks, you can watch along with us if you've got the cock. Because that this is going to be our first experience with doing a watch along on the cock. We've done them on the WWE network before, but that's not available to us anymore. So anyway, we're going to be doing that today. But you know, I'm trying to be in a good mood. I got up this morning. You know, it's a very high pollen count. Spring is about to be sprung. We're almost to the spring solstice the first day officially of spring by the time you hear this spring may have indeed sprung i woke up this morning and i counted brian i sneezed 19 times in a row i think that may be an all-time record thankfully i had my raycon wireless earbuds in my ears <laughs> they won't fall out no, no. help keep me from losing my brains what were you listening to I wasn't listening to anything. I just put them in so I wouldn't sneeze my brains out. Because everybody knows they won't fall out. But so I'm, I'm ah, ah, today, but I'm excited. Because I hate the wintertime. I've told you this. No leaves on the trees. Everything's brown and gray and dreary. I hate that time of year. Okay, there's no, there, there's no leaves on the trees. I can see all the subdivisions that have invaded the area from, from my deck or from my front office window. When the leaves are on the trees, it looks sort of like it used to around here with no people and plenty of animals. I've got the, the Bertie Sanders family is back, apparently. I've got two birds that are tag teaming, building a nest over my desk in the garage at the, the former home of the Cornets Collectibles Fulfillment Center. And they're going into my my shelves that I've got up over the desk there, I keep my papers and implements and things. And, but now the garage door is closed every night. 
so they're working on it during the day and they can't come home and go to bed at night. And they haven't figured this out yet. So I don't want to disrupt the poor things and, and interfere with nature, but, you know, I'm trying to give them the picture that you don't have access to this area all the time, but they're not getting it. But anyway, spring, the leaves are starting to bud. Finally, the birds are singing. We got more daylight along with the high pollen count. The Monroe brothers are coming out this weekend. Because as, as we talked about on the show here last year, I got them to dig all the muck and the obstructions out of Cornet Creek and got my water flowing. I've got my nice little stone sitting areas down under the oak tree. It's still a swamp down there, though. Why? Because the neighbor has not had her creek cleaned out in years. And it's got leaves and sludge and sticks and limbs and things that have fallen in there. And she's a widow woman, older than I am, not going to be impolite and reveal a lady's age. I don't expect her to get out there with the shovel and everything. So the Monroes are coming over this weekend where it's a community neighborhood project. And they're going to dig out about 200 feet of her creek so that the water will drain off my property and dry up my swamp I've got down there. So spring projects. What are you doing for the spring, Brian? What do you dig? Are you digging a canal up there? We won't be digging a canal, no. I'm trying to find someone who can help build out the library the way I envisioned it. That's really my spring project. Suzanne has her spring projects, but that's my spring project. Spring's a nice time to dig a hole for a septic tank. You got to think about doing that. That may be happening, too. We'll see. Maybe I'll put in three septic tanks. How about that? There you go. Just make sure you got one as a backup just in case. But anyway, but I not, not only have my personal projects, and everybody knows I've been in the house for a couple of years, I got to get a new pair of glasses. Haven't wanted anybody up in my face. Uh, got to gotta go to the dentist, got to get that new fence built, etc. But I've also got some projects that are going to be of interest to the fans and the listeners and the Cult of Cornette members that I've finally had the time and, and forced myself to sit down and start addressing now that the feather bottoms have taken some of the slack off of me with the mailing. Brian, I've talked to you about this, but I do not know whether I have mentioned this to the, to the general public on the programs about the audio tapes of Memphis Wrestling. Have I, have I gone into this on the show yet? I actually don't think you ever have on the show. I could be wrong, though. Well, I've mentioned in the past that I used to, you know, before we got the VCR, before that was invented, that I used to tape wrestling with the my good old-fashioned Radio Shack audio tape recorder. And also, years ago, right when I was first getting in the business, 40 years ago, one of my pen pals, a girl from Arkansas who used to send me you know, results and newspaper clippings and things from the Memphis end of the territory came up to me at the match as a, hey, I used to tape the Memphis wrestling show of my tape recorder. You know, I could identify with Adam. I don't, I am listening to him anymore. She had a crush on uh, Tommy Gilbert and Eddie Marlin at the time, I think. And so she handed me these tapes and I just got into business. I never even had a chance to sit and listen to them because then I got busy, but it's, I think 35 cassette tapes of the Memphis wrestling show, the live, that was WHBQ channel 13, um, the live program from 1974 and 1975. And right now, uh, Hotchkiss Featherbottom is transferring said cassette tapes and, and increasing the volume and sweetening them up, doing all the things you can do these days. And after that, my cassette collection that I've dug up out of the closet in the office here is, I won't say every one, because there was weekends that ain't Lola's, and, you know, tapes broke back then, those audio cassettes. and But a bulk, a good portion of all of the Memphis wrestling TV shows that aired in Louisville I, from... The end of, let's say, end of 1976 through the end of 1979, give or take, maybe start of 77, whatever, 
I've got a bunch of those on audio cassette that have never been transferred. This is, as far as I know, the only place in the world that this stuff still exists. So we dug that out. We bought some equipment, and we've got that going. And also, we've talked about, you know, the pictures I took, my days as a photographer. I have, I've said 25,000 negatives, just round numbers. When I actually try to sit down and figure it out closely, it, it might be 40,000. But I've got all these prints and negatives. We've uh, made arrangements to get one of these high-res scanners. And there's a uh, an excellent photographer here in Louisville. I'm going to be, he's already contacted me, and I'm going to be speaking to him. Hotchkiss has spoken to him. He's going to be giving us some tips on these things. So <clears throat> not only are we going to start official work on the photography book that I've always wanted to do, but also as we get this stuff digitized and cataloged, I'll be able to actually offer photo portfolios of some of the greatest stars in wrestling, my work directly off the negatives that have been preserved low these 40-something years. And then we've got uh, plans for a lot of the listeners have asked about YouTube videos on our YouTube channel with more of my wrestling memorabilia collection and some detailed looks at it rather than just the the hints and the glimpses you get on dark side of the ring or whatever so we're going to be working on some of that stuff too we've got several new classic wrestling historical projects that the people are going to be interested in so everybody should thank hotchkiss and his aunt and uncle fanny and felcher for giving me some free time to start moving forward i've been stuck in neutral for the past what, three or four years, Brian, since things got hectic, just trying to keep up with the programs and get the merchandise out and haven't done anything new or branched off in different directions. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on one second. Do I have an alarm clock sound? Wait a minute. What? I didn't mean to interrupt. Is that your alarm you. clock? Is that what your alarm clock I, sounds well, like? Well, it's get ready to get up and start the day. <laughs> um, and I haven't had any. This is another thing that people have been raking me over the coals about. Um, the new listeners of the program and the new members of the Cult of Cornet, they're happy as, as clams over the Cult of Cornet membership certificates and the action figures. The Christmas variant, by the way, at jimcornette.com, we're down to like the last 50. So there's some stragglers out there, but don't expect it to be around too long. All that stuff, they're happy as clams. But the OGs of the Cult of Cornet, the original listeners, the original fans that have bought all my shit, and they're blistering me now. Hey, it's been two years, three years, you haven't come up with anything new. What the heck, right? We're, we're itching to add to our collections. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, I can announce that that is about to change because Action Figure Armageddon Part 2 is about to take place. I didn't want to, I was going to mention this a couple of weeks ago, but then the things were still on the boat. And you know how that boat can be, Brian. The slow boat from China that Mama Cornette used to talk about is actually a real thing. But <laughs> What did Mama Cornette talk about? <clears throat> she used to say, when somebody would say, well, you need to do this or new, need to do that or whatever, she'd say, well, it'll take me about as long as if you put it on a slow boat to China or some shit like that. It used to be a thing people said, a slow boat to China. Now the slow boats are coming from China. It takes forever for them to get here, and then once they dock, you never know. Can you imagine? You see those shipping ports on television and those giant ships come in, and I don't know how they ever get things where they're supposed to be from there. But nevertheless, my ship has come in. The big news, there are not one but two brand new designs of never-before-sold Jim Cornette action figures from the Figures Toy Company that are going on sale at jimcornette.com, my brand new state-of-the-art and uncrashable website, on Saturday, April 2nd at noon Eastern. And Brian Last, perk up now. Are you ready for the description of these two incredible new designs? Please say it's the post office ninja outfit. No, the post office ninja is retired. And I don't want to lead people to believe that I might take that up again. However, 
We've talked about the post office ninja. We've talked about uh, different types of play sets. I can announce that one of these items is the brand new official Jim Cornette commentator play set. <laughs> Get out of here. Really? I am not, I'm not <laughs> kidding with you. And like Boyd Pierce used to say, you know, Boyd Pierce is an announcer for mid South wrestling in the early days. And, he would tell the guys, he'd said, yeah. He said, did you hear about the two potatoes? They fell in love, a boy potato and a girl potato. And the girl potato took the boy potato home to meet her parents because they were going to get married. And at dinner, the parent potatoes said to the girl potato, well, honey, you can't marry him. He's just a commentator. This is why Watts took him off TV when he went national. Well, it made me anyway. <laughs> anyway, the Jim Cornette commentator playset. Let me explain this to you, ladies and gentlemen. It is me, my action figure, but a completely different design, painted different colors because I'm in my announcer suit, and it comes in a deluxe display box, which includes an announcer's desk, two chairs, two microphones, two monitors, and two headsets. So now I can not only manage your superstars, but I can sit there at ringside and call the action. Jim Cornette, announcer Jim, with the two chairs, two microphones, two monitors, two headsets, and an announcer's desk in a display box. How the heck are you going to top that one? Now I can run the whole show from over at the desk in the corner. This is fantastic. It'll go great with my Hugo Savinovich figure. There you and we can do he can do color and I can do play by play and then we can bop back and forth because I can do color or play by play with the official Jim Cornette commentator play set. You be the judge of that. Also, Brian, and I gotta be honest, this this tickled me, and I I almost spilled the beans here last year because Anthony, my, my guy at Figures Toy Company, right? He's always thinking. He's a big fan. And he pitched me an idea for a figure. And Because you know how long they take to, to get done. This was over a year ago because of, of the lag time on the construction of these things. He said, what about a variant of you at this certain event in my career? And I said, well, I, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I, I wonder if the people will like it. And then last year sometime, a guy named Joe Pulley, who does bone art, he does like he's done a sketch of me, but I'm a skeleton. I have no skin. It's because I went too far with my, my diet. He had actually done a custom painted figure and sent it to me that reflects this. And a bunch of people saw it on Twitter and said, ah, I'd love to have one of those. So I want Joe to know first, I'm not stealing his idea because these have been in the works, but secondly, this made me know that it was something that people want. It's This is going to be a limited edition. This is one of a, not one of a kind, there's more than one, but this is a one-time run. These are not going to be remade. It's a special commemorative variant of me in my white jacket an outfit from the TBS show where Paulie clocked me over the head with his cell phone and I'm bleeding. It's blood splattered. The the back the 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 card backing card is splattered with blood. It's a it's a gory mess. And this figure comes with glasses, microphone, and tennis racket. Oh wow. People Oh, wow. Yeah, for all the people that have been saying, well, where's the tennis racket? Well, I finally got to be a big enough deal in the figure world. They made me a custom tennis racket. So a Jim Cornette bloody variant. There are only, well, I'm going to 1,250, but I'm keeping, keeping some. So let, there's going to be 1,200 of these available, and they will not be remade. Glasses, microphone, and tennis racket, blood-soaked white jacket, commemorating that inf infamous occasion. See, uh, Heyman, if Heyman had ever had the guts to get juice, he could have one of these. You know, in uh, the 80s, when I was a kid, because Sergeant Slaughter left before the LJN deal, he never had one of those big LJN dolls like Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant and that whole first class of right. national WWF superstars. 
he had the little G.I. Joe, which was awesome. I still have them all. But they made also, Hasbro, I believe it was, made also a LJN style and LJN sized Sergeant Slaughter. And they put an ad in the magazines where it was like standing on top of the other figures. <laughs> and it probably helped sell a bunch. I mean, they're very highly uh, sought after now. You should do that too. Put an ad in the magazine of the bloody cornet, but you could do a reverse instead of you standing on top. Have like the Young Bucks figures and the Omega figures kicking the bloody cornet. Hey, <laughs> AEW fans, do you want to do this? Get the limited edition action figure now. Oh, wait a minute. Now you've given them an idea. We should have got 5,000 of these. <laughs> if, if, Because if, now you've opened this up to a brand new market, not just my fans, but the AEW fans that want me soaked in blood at the feet of their heroes. All right, in that case, folks, there's only 1,200 of these. Get them while they last. They may not last long. That, that would have been a good idea, nevertheless. But, you know, here's the thing is, would people believe, would, would people believe that their figures could beat my figure? Maybe if they well, ganged you, up you, on me. And especially I got the tennis racket now. Because well, now I've got the whack in action. Well, do you have whack in action or do you just have the tennis racket? Because those I are got two the, entirely got different things. I whack in action of the tennis racket, right? And, and also, it'll fit in my hand if you get this racket. You could actually take the racket out of this set and interchange it with the other figures. Because it's still, I'm, I have a jack-off hand on all my figures. It holds a microphone or whatever the case. So... But anyway, but yes, the and I didn't mention the Jim Cornette commentator playset will be limited to 1,500 items at jimcornette.com, but these do go on sale Saturday, April 2nd at noon Eastern at jimcornette.com, and also they go on sale at uh, Figures Toy Company's Wrestling Superstore, same day, but of course those are not autographed. The only place to get the autographed ones is at jimcornette.com my my new unsinkable titanic of a website that will not crash that we we it won't cut off of people in mid order uh the inventory feature will mean that we can put these on sale right down to the bone um the confirmation numbers and confirmation emails are being sent out so this will be a more painless procedure for the customer than it has been in the past. It, I'm still signing everything by hand. So we're going to warn you right now, it's going to be a little while before I sign all these figures. However, the good part about it is we're not going to have to close the store again because I don't know what the fuck's going on because now we got the feather bottoms. And so, as I said, with the inventory feature and everything, no matter how many orders we get, we are not going to close the store again because of the improved processes that we've got going on over here. I may take a while to sign things, but we're going to keep things open. We've we've got a we got a process here. So this is going to be wonderful, easy and good for you. Saturday, April 2nd, noon Eastern, both these figures go on sale. And uh and, and for everyone only... asking, don't worry. The dumpster playset is coming soon. <laughs> We're just waiting for Figures Toy Company to secure their deal with the estate of the fabulous Moolah, and then we'll be ready to go. Well, but but also, more importantly, they've got to make those tiny little fur coats. And then it took, it, would... it took them eight years to make a tennis racket. I'm sure they'll yeah. go all the way with that. <laughs> that is a big deal. You know, that is a big deal for everyone who's been collecting those figures. The fact that it finally has the tennis racket. That's pretty cool. There you go. So, and the commentator playset with the headsets and the microphones and the announce desk. I don't know if is the announce desk a breakaway, a breakable one. I'm not sure. I don't I, since it's me, probably not, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for any of that tomfoolery, as Thez would say. I wouldn't brook any of that nonsense. So there you go. All right, what else are we doing here on the program today? Um, it's your show. Well, thank you very much for reminding me of that. I've got a stack, a large stack of emails that I can't pick up here from many of the cult of Cornette that I've tried to go through over the last couple of days, that things that they want to talk about, stuff they're commenting on, things they wanted to bring up. But somebody asked, this is an easy one. We're just, we're checking some things off the list here. Why did one of the 
as he was phrased, one of the announcers on an old show I saw call a suplex a souple. Who do you think he was watching, Brian? Probably Gordon Soley, if I had to guess. Yes. Um, does any, I guess, have we even, have we lost that story now? Does anybody even know what the fuck's going on with that these days? It's been so long and he was the last guy to do okay, it on yeah, TV. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and apparently, and I was the same as everybody else because the first thing I heard was suplex, right? But apparently, Gordon Soley wanted the legitimate pronunciation and or the legitimate tense usage of the the word and it is actually supposed to be souple but it was morphed into suplex somehow but gordon soley and a few other old announcers who had kind of that background but they were the last ones but that's why every once in a while you will hear you will hear on an old video vertical souple by ole anderson or whoever the fuck right suplex or souple you say tomato and I say coleslaw. It's the same thing. Um, this is an update on, uh, well, not an update, but just a comment on some of the things we've been talking about. Of kind of the world's crashing and colliding again, Brian, because we've been talking about the surprising number and consistency of objects that people are known around the world to shove up their ass lately on the program. Well, you've been talking about this mostly. Well, it, it, you were on the discussion as well. You were reacting to it, but you were in a discussion where you were talking about your squeaky chair and how that sometimes you might be hard on the chair because you plop down on it, and that may be the reason why it's squeaking instead of it being malfunctional in some kind of way, right? You finally admitted that. I admitted that it's a combination of things, and this may be yeah. a factor, but it's not the overweighing factor. Well, here is a combination. I admit that. Here's a combination of things that happen to somebody else that you may need to look out for. That's why I thought I'd bring this to your attention. Uh, this is from James. And uh, he says this story regards actual accidental anal insertion. Oh, so please don't use my name. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. This guy's name is Thanks, James. Ben. <laughs> ben Dover. Ben Dover. Yeah. I <laughs> I knew exactly where you were going, sadly. Um, <laughs> so uh, this unnamed individual says, when I was a younger teen, I was over at a friend's house playing video games when his brother damn near leapt across the room to sit in their cheap, flimsy computer chair. Due to the quality of said chair, the seat slammed down with the wrath of an angry god. This caused the spring mechanism to punch back upwards with roughly the same force. It shot through the bottom of that cheap, shitty chair like a nail through a sheet of paper and blasted directly up his asshole. The scream that erupted from his lips haunts me to this day. The horribleness and awfulness of it will never be forgotten. It took his father... He did not put that in there. No, I did that. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it took his father 30... Minutes, and I know it was 30 minutes because this guy writes 30 out as a word and then in parentheses the number 30. 30 minutes to dislodge the chair with the help of my friend, me, and the neighbor who came over when he heard the ruckus. Oh, get the fuck out of here. 30 minutes See, for all these people. <laughs> to get this chair. The subsequent trip to the emergency room ended with 26, in com parentheses, 26 stitches between his torn sphincter and the damage to his colon. Oh, fuck. In closing, if there's any oh. takeaway from this story, unless the individual claiming they slipped and fell has massive rectal trauma, they are a liar. See there? Now we're getting to the meat of this. How it what? really happened. What? Okay, I guess. I have no idea. Now that can be a cautionary tale for you, Brian, with your plopping down. This has nothing to do with that. Those are two completely separate things. And, well, they, they converged right up, right at, at the asshole alley. Get the neighbor to help. <laughs> yeah, well, he heard the ruckus. They didn't really have to go call for I don't me. feel like getting up. Just roll me. Roll me to the hospital. Roll, roll me away. Won't you roll me away tonight? Uh, did you hear about a musical now? Uh, did you hear about a fellow 
named Christone Kingfish Ingram. Have you heard? You're a big music fan. Have you heard about this guy? I have, yes. When did you hear about him? Uh, just the other day on Twitter. <laughs> the other day from on Twitter for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, no, uh, he was a guy uh, when Jade Cargo came out on the pay-per-view. Well, see, I zipped through that. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. That was the that was the best part of the match. Quite well, frankly. see, well, I know that. See, that's why I knew that ahead. Of, I didn't know that ahead of time. I didn't know that the entrance would be the best part of the match. I didn't know there'd be a good part of the match. That's why I skipped it. But I've just seen this guy in the news. Apparently, within the last year, he's got the number one blues album or debuted with the number one blues album. And it's still on the charts after a year. And. I watched a couple of clips of him. He's insane. He can, uh, at 22 years old, and he's a badass guitar player, and he can sing. He's from Clarksdale, Mississippi, so he's actually authentic as far as a blues guy, but he's also a member of the Cult of Cornette, and I found that he just did an interview that was put up, and now the, geez, the guy that did the interview on the whatever the website was, I saw it on Twitter, and I can't remember everybody's name. And they're fans too, or he's a fan, the guy that wrote it, so he's going to be mad. Here's my chance at greatness. But uh, whatever your name was, you did a good article. But anyway, Kingfish Ingram is a member of the Cult of Cornette. When are you going to send a goddamn song into the drive through contest, Kingfish? Why, you'd, you'd blow some people out of the water. And maybe it's because it's your show, Brian. He, he'll probably send something to the experience here. Oh, well, we haven't confirmed or found out anything yet if he's a member of the Legion of Last. We have to find out. Well, uh, he'll get around to it eventually. Priorities. Maybe, um, maybe a lucrative contract from Arcadian Vanguard Records. You never know. <laughs> Is that an offshoot of Arcadian Vanguard Limited or Arcadian Vanguard International or Arcadian Vanguard LLC or Arcadian Vanguard and Son? Well, there's no Arcadian Vanguard and Sun, but there are several other entities that you just yeah, listed. There are that several other exist. entities. <laughs> yes. The Arcadians over there at, are vanguarding. Um, well, here's, a, here's another uh, email from Matthew, who did not ask for his name to be redacted. Hello, Jim. I'm a 38 year old man with a wife and son. I recently heard your podcast about gerbling. And it caught my attention. God damn, more of this? It sounded ridiculous at first, but as you dug deeper into the subject, it got me thinking. <laughs> nice wording there. <laughs> <laughs> there must be a merit to gerbling, right? Why else would so many people do it? I'm a pretty open-minded guy, so I figured why not see what all the fuss is about? Oh no, come on, let's stop. There's so no I, way. Well, uh, so I made a decision to purchase a gerbil. I will keep you updated on how everything turns out and want to thank you for changing my life. I don't know where I'll get the get cocaine, the though. <laughs> Sincerely, Matthew. Thank you for changing my life. Oh, there's a PS. If you haven't guessed by now, I'm only joking. I would like to hear Brian's reaction to my email if you read it on your podcast. Well, there you go, you sick oh. fuck. <laughs> I was like, who do I call? Who do we call to stop this man? Well, just stop this man. Would it be animal control? Would it be PETA? Who is would it, it be? I don't know. That's a great question. Is that hard on the gerbil or is it just rougher on the person? Is the gerbil like, I'm happy here. It's a fucking condo down here. Do PETA get along with the ASPCA? Well, they've got, they both got P in their name. They're both searching out for money. Now, hey, now, if they're trying to help the, our friends, the furry woodland creatures, they, they've got to be I agree. honest, I reputable people. Hey, listen, if I give you money to help animals, I want you to help animals. But when you read these reports about how much money is going to the fucking executives there and all that other shit, then it's like, what the fuck? There has to be a better way to do this. Well, why don't you start one, Arcadian Pet Guard? Come on, now you're being ridiculous. <laughs> I could change your life. <laughs> all righty um pet guard here's a uh <laughs> hey here's a, a note on uh, i i know the aew ratings have been going down lately this may be a contributory factor apparently ladies and gentlemen no more 
will we have one of our favorite wrestlers to talk about fondly and analyze his performances? We haven't seen him in a while anyway, but now it's official. Jelly Nutella is finished in AEW. He will not be, re he's done an interview explaining why he will not be re-signing with AEW. And that, that interview immediately followed my <laughs> statement where I announced that I would under no circumstances, no matter what, uh, accept Donald Trump's entire fortune that he's offering to give me if I'll stop talking about him. So no, he he he, he said, I'm not going to resign again. <laughs> AEW botches on Twitter had a had a great compilation of Jelly stumbling and falling and failing and fumbling, and it was a nice little send off for him. Apparently, the first round of Mud Show uh, signees are going back to the to the mud. Um, Apparently, this also, it, it, he had heat for breaking Eddie Kingston's face and keeping him off TV that time when they just started an angle with him. And apparently, that wasn't the first time he'd landed on somebody or stumbled and fell on him or whatever. So, yeah. with the constant botching and falling and hurting and things, they finally decided, well, you know, maybe we just shouldn't let him do this anymore. Yeah, for everyone that jumped on me, the few little Jelly Nutella supporters out there, how could you say he's dangerous or he hurts people when I said it a few years ago? Because <laughs> he's dangerous and he hurts people. It's because the wrestlers were saying it. No one came out and publicly said it. I remember even Jungle Boy defended him. Oh, I can't believe anyone said you ever hurt anyone in the ring. Yeah, and then you watch him and you see it happen. And then you hear about these other things that are happening in places you're not seeing anything happen. And see, here's and the, it's his reputation there. So it turns out once again really I was right. He's not really strong enough to hurt anybody on purpose, but it's when you open yourself up and he falls on you accidentally. That's that's when heartaches begin. But anyway, we wish him the best in his future endeavors at the car wash in Parsippany. Hey, can I ask you a question? I wish you would. Serious question on this. The Jelly Nutellas, the Marco Stunts, various other people. Apparently, Peter Avalon's now being used on a nightly deal he's not there <laughs> under contract any longer but there are various people that from the early days of aew were there obviously you had a problem with them various other fans had a problem with them but they were there they're now slowly leaving they're not being fired their contracts are expiring and actually the one thing that was interesting <laughs> from what jelly said was apparently aew just stops communicating with you yeah, all together yeah, it's just <laughs> that's the best part is like <laughs> if whenever whenever you're done and they, they don't want to resign you they're not going to say you're done you're fired they're not going to say leave they're not going to say we don't want you they're just not going to ever speak to you again and you just drift off and wander around it's like it's like the rib where hey can you watch my bag on the sidewalk sure and the guy never comes back you're stand. how long are you going to stand there watching the fucking bag and then pretty soon you just wander off so all of the initial mud show signees are just wandering off. So what do you think now, looking back on the first couple of years, or especially like the first few months, the first year of Dynamite, of course, the pandemic hit pretty quickly, but the usage of these guys, looking at then and looking where we are now, was that just padding the roster, we need people, and that's why we're getting rid of them now, or was it... Tony Khan realized that some of these signings were wrong. What do you think this really is that these guys are just, it's the guys that you would suspect. I mean, it's everyone, yeah. it's everyone we talked about on the show for a while that these guys are killing the show and now they're all leaving. Well, I mean, it's all, it's all of the above number of the things you mentioned. Um, you know, I don't know why that a wrestling booker can't adopt the uh, the idea that he's a wrestling physician and adopt his own Hippocratic oath and first do no harm. If you needed wrestlers to fill out a roster just to put other people over, just numbers, and like you said, do we just need people? Just people? Well, there were competent, quality, serious indie guys that would have could have just had matches for you with that were halfway trained properly and could have put people over and you might have had some of those guys break out of the pack 
but instead, it, on the advice of his EVPs, and I'm sure some of their friends, it was a constant influx of indie darlings and guys with goofy gimmicks that 75 people in a fucking church gym laugh at, or it was cute on the internet, and, oh, he's got a following. He's got a following because his videos are viral because he wrestles while wearing a fucking bowl of fruit on his head or whatever. You got to sign this guy. And he ended up with a collection of fucking fruits and nuts, <laughs> as they used to call a WWE, and Tony became Vince, the head cashew. It just, it was a gimmicked up bunch of talent that was in some cases not ready now, in other cases never will be ready for fucking television that were the friends, the play wrestling friends of the other play wrestlers. And for all that everybody can talk about, and it was a, a great accomplishment to get a wrestling program back on one of the Turner Networks, uh, and it took a guy that was already doing business with him and owned professional sports teams, et cetera, to do it. And it ran in the same social circles. But if he could have only then gone on a real worldwide search for talent and tried to find guys that either you could feature as main event stars and that's the, the bulk of your money drawn. And yeah, the Twinkle Toeses and the Hardly Boys is, as well as Jericho and all the other the names that he started out with, but for the underneath talent, instead of just getting some guys that were serious about their business and may be able to advance and would put those top guys over, he got the friend brigade where everybody's everybody that he signed to be a top guy had four good friends. They were an embarrassment to the wrestling business and somewhere or another got talked, he got talked into signing them. And now he's probably embarrassed to say, well, we're letting you go because you're the shits. Well, you signed me and I'm, I'm better now than I was two years ago. Yeah, but I didn't know what I was doing then. What's he going to say? A lot of these people should have never been in the wrestling business, much less on television, national television. This, but it's just, at least come out at some point and take charge of your shit, Tony. Call some people in and say, look, you got me for two years for more money than you've ever made in your life, but we got to move on and you're not part of it. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Thank you for your you support, know, really. Whatever, be nice to them, be mean to them, I don't care, but tell them something. You, can, you know, it, it, he's afraid of hurting somebody's feelings that he has paid... Every one of these people that we've heard that their contract is expiring or being, you know, not renewed or they're slowly wafting off into the wilderness, the fact that they were highly paid by a national wrestling company to begin with indicates that they lucked out and they, they're ahead of the game. He's afraid of hurting their feelings now when nobody else would have paid them anywhere near that amount of money to do anything in the wrestling business over the last couple of years. And now he's embarrassed to say, we're not going to do it anymore. The fuck? Well, if we look at some of the roster moves, Jelly Natella has announced that he will not be, he's not open to re-signing if they actually would <laughs> offer him a contract. <laughs> Big Swole originally said that she, I think it was the same thing. I decided, we mutually decided that it'll be best for both parties if I didn't what? resign. No, you know what? You bring that up. He, she actually talked to Tony. Maybe he was like, after that, well, I'm not going to go through that again. We talked and made nice, and everybody was happy, and then she fucking leaves two weeks later. She's burying me. I'm just ignoring the rest of these motherfuckers. Let them try to find me. Well, Jim, another thing that was in the interview was he talked about backstage heat. He had with Christopher Daniels, who is an agent in AEW. So we hear a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes, but again, the Big Swole situation, the Chavo situation, Jelly Nutella, I believe we've now heard, it may have been from Jelly also, but also other things have gotten out. Marco Stunt has just not heard from anyone. <laughs> His contract's coming up, and just people stopped calling him. He stopped hearing from anyone you there. You know what? I bet you, I bet you that Marco Stunt 
is one of these little gerbils that's been caught lodged up somebody's rectum, and that's why nobody can oh, find him. Oh, stop it. Will you stop it? Out. Will you stop? And then he's, every once in a while, so, like, guy walking down the street, you'll hear, let me out. Um, Did you know Marco stunts the same size as Adam Cole? No, he's not. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But stop it. Let me ask you this. Saying something ridiculous like that. Going back to my question. A, AEW, you agree, needs someone in that role. I hate to use talent relations, because that's a WWE term that now is universal for the wrestling business. But does, yeah. do they need someone for talent relations? And B, yes. who's next? Um, Goldberg. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, it, I, I've heard Christopher da- Daniels is supposed to be the head of talent relations. and everybody knows Tony Khan makes all the deals. Tony Khan signs the contracts and he probably gives then Chris paperwork to do whatever. I will say this. If Christopher Daniels doesn't like you, then you're probably a fucking asshole or a wise ass or a little smart mouth prick. And I would think that dwarf dong sucker fits all those categories. And probably so does Joey. uh, I couldn't say his fake name or his real name. Joey Jatella, Janella, whatever the fuck his name is. Both those little (laughs) mealy-mouthed, smart-faced pricks fit that you can can probably tell what their goddamn attitude is. I wouldn't be surprised if Chris Daniels doesn't like jelly. Um, But yes, you need some, and somebody will say, well, Jim Ross served in that position for years and years in the biggest wrestling promotion in the world. And that's probably exactly why that he wouldn't fucking do that job now to save his life if you begged him to, especially with dealing with a lot of these fucking wrestlers. At least he had to deal with people that Vince had signed, as well as then later on ones he signed. But when he got the job, he had to deal with Vince's roster that he had signed and all the heartaches and negotiations and blah, blah, blahs that he's enumerated, written about in his books. Remember the one, the one time he said a wrestler got mad because his wife found out that he'd bought his girlfriend a boob job and put it on his credit card. And somehow that was the office's fault or something. Can you imagine what kind of goofy statements and pissy problems that the the younger generation of wrestlers in AEW would probably present to a goddamn talent relations executive. I can only imagine. And 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 the fans are calling me names. <clears throat> so, but well, be- yeah, they they need somebody to do that. But they need somebody to book. They need somebody to format the television show. They need somebody to not only. Uh, administrate talent relations but also tell the talent what kind of relations they need to be having put her put their foot down about various things none of that happens because tony thinks he can do everything and still be everybody's friend who's next you know what we ought to take a look at the goddamn AEW roster. We threatened to do that one time before. After I read these emails, we have time. We might do it today. But they have kept most of the really outlaw dreck off television and or the problem children like Brian Cage for months now. But I'm already getting a fucking feeling that Danhausen is going to be something that we never get rid of. And it's never going to be explained, and it's never going to make any sense. And, but I, I don't know who, what undeserving individual will be the next one out the door because I don't have a list of them in front of me. I can't. Who, who can you think off the top of your head? I don't know if he'll be next, but I think he'll be in the next. Well, I don't know when his contract comes up, but I don't think he'll. I don't think he's long for AEW. Colt Cabana. <laughs> Okay, I forgot Colt was there. See that the the one thing about the Dork Order, nobody likes them, nobody wants to see them, and they mean nothing. But it's a great place to hide because there's so many of them. If you don't want people to notice you, but you still want to somehow look like you're earning your money by appearing, that's a great place to to be. They can just kind of all hide in the numbers, and you forget. 
he never wrestles. He never talks. He just stands around and every once in a while takes a ride on Adam Page's lawnmower, right? He doesn't even get to do his bad comedy. He does nothing. He just stands in the background. You just see a face over shoulders. Hey, the professionals are in charge now. The bad comedy that these guys are doing is way worse than the bad comedy that Cabana used to do. He's he's lost his status as the worst comedian in wrestling. That must be painful. Not only has he lost that status, but now he appears in the Young but the Young Bucks crew skits, like the Dark Order stuff. Did you just rename them again, the Young Butts? I didn't say Young Butts, did I? <laughs> I think you said Young Butts. I said Young Bucks, not Young Butts. You know what? The problem is Tony, is. <laughs> Tony Khan, Tony Khan needs assistance. He needs help. He can't see the forest for the trees, Brian. He's, he's trying to do too much. He's taking too much on himself. He needs a good booker. He needs a good talent. Relay. I bet he needs a good CFO. You know what a CFO is, don't you? Chief the financial chief, officer. Chief financial officer. And of today's course. CFO is critical to the strategy and success of the business. And if you've got a growing company like Tony does, well, it's, it may not be growing, but it's pulsating every now and then. But there's two kinds of CFOs. There's one who's struggling to keep up, covered up in spreadsheets and manual processes and making errors. And there's a lack of visibility in the numbers. He's just guessing about things like Jim Crockett's old accountant that <laughs> brought an end to the company. It takes weeks to close the books. Or you can have a CFO that's on top of their game, automated reports, inventory, e-commerce, HR flow, other words that people use in finances that I don't know the meaning of. It can flow right into your financial model seamlessly with insights coming with the click of a button thanks to the people at NetSuite. They are the number one cloud financial system. If you want to invest money in clouds, ladies and gentlemen, they're number one. You give them their money, they shoot it up in the air, it sticks in the cloud, you never see it again. But it will rain down on you with success because the byproduct is you will understand your business. You'll have visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, and budgeting. If you don't want to pay somebody, if you owe somebody some money and you don't want to pay them, NetSuite will help you figure out a way to screw them six that's not, from no, Sunday. Let's not, let's not do that. Let's not incorporate the company, what? the sponsor, with whatever sort of well, I thought that's embezzlement what and, you're encouraging here. Accountants and bookkeepers were supposed to do, figure out ways to keep the company's money and screw other people that are trying to take it. Now, you see, you're not talking about Jim Crockett's accountant anymore. You're talking about Vince McMahon's. Okay, but you, well, you were talking about embezzlement. So if you want to embezzle from your company, folks, and you're an no. accountant, if you get this NetSuite stuff, you will know exactly what's going on. The boss doesn't know what's happening. None That's of the other employees, just you. No. What? No. No? No. <laughs> no? No. NetSuite is everything you need to grow your business all in one place. <laughs> And you can automate your processes and close your books in no time. Keep those books closed. You don't want anybody looking through them after you finish giving them the net suite. And you'll be <laughs> you'll be retiring to a fucking the island off the French Riviera with NetSuite's capabilities to just completely draw all the money out of any account and just do anything you want to with it. <laughs> 93% of surveyed businesses increased their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. 7% of those businesses called the federal authorities. What? And over 28,000 businesses already used NetSuite. Yeah. And, and then it's, 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 it's incredible. People are stealing money left and right. No. Uh, from, well, no, they're not the customers. You're stealing money from the customers, see, because you've got the net suite. You know what's going on. Not, it's the other people that you're cheating. That's not how it don't works. Know what's happening. It's not how it works. NetSuite tells you how to make millions. Head to NetSuite. That's N E T S U I T E dot com slash J C E for a special one of a kind financing offer. You're not going to believe what you hear from them. Just make sure, just bring your fucking checkbook. NetSuite.com slash JCE. NetSuite.com slash JCE for a one-of-a-kind financing offer on how you 
can do whatever it is that NetSuite allows you to do that I can mention here without Brian shutting me up. You're going to make a lot of money off of this. Just don't tell the authorities. Well, we've appreciated having NetSuite as a sponsor and thank them for their contributions. But uh, we got another email. Oh, great. From Brandon from Vancouver, Canada. I've been to Vancouver. It's a great city. I love Vancouver. My favorite place in Canada. It's too far away. I'll never go there again, but I loved it. But anyway, he says, uh, since the women love getting involved in this topic, I went ahead and found the answer for the most important question because the fans have been asking, they've been sending in, why is my, or how come my, we've had guys do it. We've had girls do it. Now we've got a guy doing it about a girl, but what is the most important question? that you should type into your Google machine, Brian, if you're a married man. What's the most important question I should type in if I'm a married man? Yes. I haven't had to ask Google any questions to help me with my marriage. I don't know. You're supposed to type in, why is my wife? No, I'm not playing yes. this game. No, no, come on, come on. She's Colombian, it's, I'll get killed. <laughs> it starts out so, so lovely and and compassionate and romantic the number one answer when you type in why is my wife according to Jim, uh, to brandon from vancouver why is my wife so beautiful ah that's very nice see now you're gonna have a problem with that and then number two putting her over as well why is my wife always right who the fuck is Googling? Oh, let's stop for a second. Who is sitting there? Man, my wife is beautiful. Why is she so beautiful? Let me Google this. My wife, she always tell me I'm wrong, correcting me. She's right. Why is she always right? Who would Google these things? I don't get it. Well, well, I'm just telling you what Brandon is reporting. If you want to conduct your own research over there. Is this in Canada? Is this Canadian This is Google? in Canada. People are a little more polite up there. It sounds like they're a lot more polite if those are the first two things they're Googling up there in Canada for why is my wife. Yeah. They're very nice people. They, they don't have conflict and personal issues like we do. Well, well, let's go to number three. Maybe they have a bit of it. Why is my wife so dumb? Number can I, three. Can I just say, it has to be a Canadian thing, because I just did Why Is My Wife, and I got a different list altogether. Well, hold, we'll go to yours in a second. Why is my wife, number four, why is my wife so annoying? <laughs> number five, why is my wife so lazy? <laughs> That's here, <too. laughs> Number six, why is my wife so selfish? Now, have you noticed we're not good? Because other times when people have asked this question, they were worried about their health or something they had possibly done to affect it. Why is my taint throbbing? Whatever the case. But this is, I think it's it's some online therapy or Man, something. You know here. what? A part of me thinks because there are no answers to any of these questions, <laughs> then maybe they're doing it hoping that the wife will see this. Yes. Like, I hate him. I go through his search all the time, so I know what he's up to. Oh. Look at this. He's Googling, why am I so beautiful? Uh-huh. Why am I always right? Why am I lazy? What? Yeah. Dumb. Annoying. Selfish. Number seven. Why is my wife always angry? Possibly because you think she's dumb, annoying, lazy, and selfish. But number eight, this is from Vancouver. This could be totally limited to that region of the world. Number eight, why is my wife sleeping with my neighbor? <laughs> and he says, yes, this was actually a suggestion that came up. <laughs> why? It's, it's, it, the fact that the question is being asked is what gets me. But now here's the I don't thing. know what to it's, do. I'm going to Google it. <laughs> it's not my brother. It's not my friend. It's not my... Boss, it's my neighbor. It's the neighbors you got to... I thought they were neighborly up there in Canada. Now maybe we find out why. Well, those are the eight responses. What did you get? Why is my wife? Well, my number one was, why is my wife so mean? <laughs> number two is, why is my wife always mad at me? <laughs> and then I got some of the, I guess, the regulars. Why is my wife so beautiful? Why is my wife so annoying? 
Why is my wife always cold? <laughs> Why is my wife mad at me? Why is my wife so awesome? See, again, what, I'm not saying we don't have awesome wives out for? there, but who's Googling that and why? Yeah. Would that be, would you want to know? Don't ask the question if you don't want the answer. Would, if, if, leave well enough alone oh, in right. some cases. I'm going right? to Google it. Why is my wife so awesome? And then it's just advice you can give your wife. Five phrases every <laughs> wife needs to hear daily. Four reasons your husband really needs you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What are the five phrases that your wife needs to hear every day? All right, hold on. Let me click this link. This link here from fiercemarriage.com. Uh, I don't know if you want me to read her whole little article. I assume it's a woman. I don't, I don't want to read the whole article. I'd just like to know the answer to those five things that okay. they teased us with in the headline. Here it is. The five phrases every wife needs to hear often. Number one, I love you. Number two, I love you the way you are. <laughs> Number three, I'm proud of you. Number four, I'll always love you, no matter what. Number five. <laughs> number five. You're beautiful. <laughs> so fierce marriage just suggests you butter up anyone with the big swole treatment like Tony Khan's in the house. There was a lot of repetition there also when you think about it, when it comes right. It's like the George Carlin routine where he boiled the Ten Commandments down to two. You could you could condense that list. Well, I have another one. Oh, great. Another one from, from CJ. Didn't mention where CJ is from or what his gender is. Or his, I just, what his gender is. What their gender, oh, goddamn, I don't know who CJ is, but he <laughs> or she or it Googled they. they, however many of them there are, why is my shark-infested death pit of razors? <laughs> wait, wait. First of all, I didn't know we were going to do another why is my. That took me by surprise, but what is the actual thing he Googled? Why is my shark-infested death pit of razors? <laughs> and they didn't have any suggestions. <laughs> Thank you, CJ. That was good. That yeah. Was good. Thank you very much, CJ. Speaking of not having any answers, we, we got finally got somewhat of an answer uh, here recently on why in the French fried you-know-what that the Briscoes are not in AEW feuding with FTR so we could see some tag team wrestling, and the answer is, has been leaked that one of the Warner Media executives... Don't want the Briscoes because of Jay's mean tweets in the past that were construed as being homophobic. And we covered that on the previous program. Well, to be fair, they well, weren't construed as homophobic. They well, were they, they, a bit like, over the top and homophobic. It'd be like an assault battery and homicide in the street could be construed as aggressive behavior. But Right. Um <laughs> But anyway, uh, I guess there was, it wasn't a lot of hidden meaning in the tweets. They, they were pretty much construed the way they were strewed. But anyway, I had postulated the theory. And I said, it's, it's with a lot of these people that don't understand it's either environment, re upbringing, religion, that God is mad in some way, and therefore we must take action, that type of thing. And that was just me positing a theory based on being around the Briscoes. Well, Jay Briscoe has actually issued another apology statement where he said, hey, we love everybody. The Briscoes ain't like that. We don't hate nobody. We're just some country boys. And here was his quote. I thought I was taking a stand for the Lord back in the day. There you go. And then he said it was the most, the most, this is a quote, the most dumbest, immature, obnoxious shit that I've ever done. So how much sorrier can somebody be? And then Mark was in the interview also, and Mark then quoted uh, 
I don't know if it's quoting scripture, but went into a very positive religious statement about how God loves everybody and blah, 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 and that's what he believes. But it's, it still is the... Eh. I knew there was something at the root of it like that. He's convinced if he watched the right-wing lunatics on the news that if gay people can get married, then everybody's going to come in the bathroom and molest his children. And or if gay people are allowed to be married or any of the other things that the religious folks are upset about, that God's going to be mad or in some way harmed somehow, and we must take up for him. And that's what I'm just saying. That's what we got to start fighting. If we're instead of just telling everybody that, oh, you're goddamn so and so phobic, get to the root of the problem. Why are we deluding children from an early age with these horror stories about how a supreme being is going to punish everyone in hell and brimstone and fire forever unless they toe the line? What were you going to say, Brian? Well, I was going to say. I didn't get to hear the interview, but I read the apology and his brother's statements. And it seemed sincere just from the written word. And it seemed pretty thorough as far as an apology went. How, how much more can you apologize for a, a tweet? They didn't even have 240 characters back then. It was before that. So how much more can you apologize for less than 140 letters in a statement? But here's the other problem. Who's he really apologizing to? Are the wrestlers that upset, or has he already apologized to wrestlers, or the wrestlers know him, or wrestlers been around him? Is he apologizing to people he's worked for, or they know him, they've been around him? Is he apologizing for future employers, or do they understand this is a situation that he's sorry about and he genuinely didn't mean? Or is he apologizing to an unnamed executive who may not even be paying attention to any of this anymore? That's what's unfair about the whole situation. There's no resolution. It's just, we hear that an edict was made, you can't have him on these shows. That's it. And now he's apologizing because the story's out there again and everyone, and rightfully so, it's pretty, like we said it the other day, it's really ignorant shit that he put out there. And I said we had to hear from him. He needs to apologize and clarify. And it sounds like he did. So the question becomes, can you accept someone's apology? If you are religious, can you forgive them for that apology? And can you move on? And I don't know if they ever really can move on from this if there's no answer. If there's not like, you know, some executive is going to say, well, I heard the apology and I changed my mind. If there's not that, you know, he's just out there explaining who he is and he kind of needed to do that right now. Well, and again, a lot of people listen to our clip talking about it. And, well, Cornette, if he was a right-wing guy like that, Cornette, he just takes up for people he likes. Well, no shit. But again, <laughs> this is not the Briscoe brothers. Mark and Jay Briscoe, the chicken farmers from Sandy Fork, Delaware, are not in charge of anything important that affects anybody else. They are not in charge of nor contributing to making public policy. They're not appointing judges to courts to create laws or strike laws down. They are certainly not instigating an overthrow of the United States government in an in insurrection because they're a sore loser that they lost an election and or the people enabling same. This is not serious life and death, real life consequences for people. Those kind of people ought to be kicked off Twitter that lie and, and rabble rouse and create dissension amongst people on the basis of falsehoods no that kind of free speech shouldn't be allowed but somebody from a chicken farm says something stupid and apologizes for it and 10 years later people are still up in fucking arms when a lot of other people have said you know they're not bad people now just fuck you i will goddamn take up for those people i will not take up for anybody that tries to have an, a, a derogatory effect on the real world and everybody in it and has the power and position to do that. There's the difference. They ain't going to get that either. Um, Ring of Honor, though. Tony puts him in Ring of Honor where they've always been and in some way it is fitting just the story of the Briscoes. And by the way, then you could also do FTR Briscoes, Ring of Honor. 
I don't care at this point if they do it at the goddamn uh, Dizzy Whiz Burger Place down on fucking Broadway in Louisville. Just do it somewhere. For fuck's sake, I'm sick and tired of watching kids play at tag team wrestling. Uh, where, what's up? What's next on the top of my stack? Hey, can I hit you with something? Hit me, hit me, baby. Jim, did you see the rules for CYN Wrestling? So we've been talking about this on the <laughs> drive through Control Your Narrative, this funny little group of guys doing these very interesting things. They released their rules, their official rules. Remember the NWA used to have their official rules in the magazine? Yes. Yes, every every wrestling promotion should have their rules and regulations printed so the fans can get used to them. And no, I haven't seen this because I saw the announcement, but you, Brian Last, you asked me yesterday on the telephone, did you see this? And I said, no. And I said, better yet, instead of me reading it now, hit me with it on the show tomorrow. What are the rules of their wrestling promotion? I will hear these for the first time. I hope I'll be pleasantly surprised well these were posted on the official twitter account of ec3 like you said it's roman numerals or ec the third depending on how you see it here or ec i i i the rules and regulations of cyn control your narrative number one or let me say rule one rule one you are in control rule two you are in control. What? What? <laughs> in caps this time. In control of what? Rule three. Fights end when you tap out, get knocked out, can't stand, or quit. Sanctioned matches can end via pinfall. Oh, wait, wait. Hold up. What did you just say? Fights end... When you tap out, get knocked out, can't stand, or quit. Sanctioned matches, and matches is in quotations, can end via pinfall. So, so they're differentiating their matches from their fights. Well, that may be answered in... <laughs> what? It, that, it just... <laughs> that may be answered in rule four here. Let me okay. read this. Standard professional wrestling rules apply for sanctioned matches. Chaos ensues in the project pit. Oh, boy. <laughs> what is the... In the project why, pit? Why is that in rule four? <laughs> what... <laughs> <laughs> the project pit. So, so far, they've told us twice that we're in control, but they didn't say what we're in control of. We're just in control of everything. But how can everybody be in control? Because everybody can't be in control because then if everybody was in control, there wouldn't be any control of anything to be in control of. And to your question, trying to parse through this, there are fights, there are sanctioned matches, and then chaos ensues in the project pit. So three different types of encounters, I would imagine. Okay. Rule five. No hashtag super kicks. No hashtag tope suicidas. <laughs> no hashtag Canadian destroyers. <laughs> okay, well, now that's a good one. I'm giving that one a thumbs up. All right, well, rules. But that just three specific things that they have outlawed. What about, what about thumbtacks? Well, maybe they could amend the, uh, the rules and regulations at a later time, but rule six, the fight isn't with your opponent, it is with yourself. Well, <laughs> okay, then, <laughs> then why is the fucking guy standing in front of me punching me in the face? Shouldn't I be doing it myself? <laughs> What the, why are you fighting with yourself? Rule seven. Fights will go on as long as they have to. Sanctioned matches hit their times. Hit their times? In caps, yes. Wait, it shouldn't be sanctioned matches will have a time limit after the fights go as long as they need to go, but, but they're saying hit their time. like. 
so they're trying to say that the matches are going to be fake and they're only going to go as long as they're told to go. But the fights might go as long as they need to go because they're not fake. Now, is this what they're trying to say? I think so. That's kind of what I see. Without here. saying it, because they're trying to beat around the bush and get cute. With chaos ensuing in the project pit, we still don't know yeah. what the hell that is. Rule eight, if you want to control your narrative, you have to fight. And that is the final rule of the rules and regulations of control your narrative wrestling. That's just <laughs> soon a, to be seen nowhere <laughs> on nothing. <laughs> <laughs> coming, coming soon to thin air near you. And I, do you understand anything about what, besides the fact that, that, they're not going to have Canadian destroyers, tope suicidas, and super kicks, which I'm all in favor of. I don't understand anything else that's going on there. There's no, there's no detail or explanation. And those are not rules. Those are suggestions, <laughs> I guess, if nothing else, or possibly a pithy statement. Um, I, I, those aren't rules. I, you know, there are a lot of guys who. And I'm not saying this about anyone specifically, but there's a lot of guys who grew up watching Vince McMahon's WWE and loved wrestling and wanted to get into the business. And maybe because of the nature of the program they grew up watching, it's not like, oh, I want to get in there and I wish I could be on Jim Crockett Promotions TV doing those great angles. No, it's kind of like, I wish I can get in the wrestling business and have my ideas heard and then shift the business to be something else. You know, like the Malachi Blacks, and then you see this. No one realizes what works and what doesn't work. They all want to. They all want to show what they could do. They all want to do their acting. They all have ideas about how to change the business, and it's all terrible. Just do simple wrestling. It works. Huh. Well, speaking of simple wrestling, I have an email about one of the simplest, not rules, but one of the simplest maneuvers or things in all of wrestling: the tag. And I'd like to read that. Oh, and by the way, and there's a preface first. Also an answer to a question. This is from Robert in Wasco, California. Because, uh, dear Jim and Brian, you asked the question about how much wrestling, my way of distinguishing pro from amateur wrestling, both of which I enjoy very much, how much wrestling experience Ronda Rousey had her first time around. The following information comes from the Internet Wrestling Database. So apparently, because we said, <laughs> did they did they expose her this bad before in the first run? Did they leave her twisting in the wind on promos or in battle royals where she didn't know what to fucking do? It seems like she's being exposed as greener and more inexperienced now than, than we had seen her before. Apparently, this is a grand total of all the pro wrestling matches Ronda Rousey has had to date. In that previous run, she wrestled on Raw 18 times. She wrestled on Pay-Per-View 11 times. MSG shows twice. And one tribute to the troops. Between April 8, 2018 and April 7, 2019. That's 32. She had 32 matches. In one year, and then took three years off. So no wonder, but... I think they hit it better before. But anyway, Robert continues on a separate matter. I have often heard you decry tag teams making tags which are not proper, correct legal tags. Could you please clarify for us precisely what constitutes a valid tag? Is it any part of the arm up to and including the top of the deltoid? Is it any part of the arm below the deltoid or perhaps the elbow? Also, can any surface of the hand arm be tagged or only the outer or upper or some other part of same? I always understood it was any part below the deltoid, but I could be wrong. It wouldn't be the first or probably the last time. Thank you for your expert analysis and explanations. We have come to the point 
of time in the wrestling business where we have to explain not only to the fans and to the wrestlers how the fuck you're supposed to make a tag. It's that sad, Brian. And I'm not even talking about the hot tag now because nobody can get that. I'm talking about just a fucking tag. And it's not that difficult. And this was, if people say, well, you make this shit up, Cornette, or how, if it hadn't been that way, I watched wrestling 20 years ago and pay, well, I'm not saying that people haven't been fucking this up for 20 years. But the way that you understood this during the old days, the territory days, when everybody watched wrestling and everybody was a wrestling fan all over the country and all different parts of the, all the different territories, some places cared more, some cared less, some beat rules into your head more, and some, you know, there weren't a lot of rules in Detroit when the Sheik was in charge, because that was his kind of thing. But generally, you would pick up on these things if you were a regular watcher of the one hour of television wrestling a week you got on TV, and especially if you went to the live matches every week or every two weeks or every month in your town, because every town had them, it wouldn't take you long to pick up on this because it would just be little spots and matches or little things the announcers would say. A legal tag is simply this. When the guy on the apron waiting to be tagged into the match has both feet on the apron, He's either holding the tag team rope or touching the top turnbuckle with it one hand, and he's reaching over the top rope, and you tag hand to hand. That's it. And the reason for those things is you got to have both feet on the apron because heels would often, in trying to reach and, and fucking cheat, stand up on the bottom rope and lean over to get a better reach, and the referee would go over and point to them and make them get down. And the announcer would just, one throwaway line, ah, oh, he's making Brian Last get back down on the apron, you can't tag unless your feet are on the apron, and go right on. Uh, or another time, a heel would be trying to bend, when a, another heel was working toward the corner for the tag, a heel would try to cheat by bending under the rope, and where you get more reach and trying to tag that way, and the referee would come over and block it and disallow it and show you have to reach over the top rope. And every once in a while, one of the baby faces, when the when the heels were getting heat on his partner, one of the baby faces would leave the corner and would work his way while he's clapping and cheering for his partner. He'd work his way kind of down to the middle of the ring and be reaching over the top for a tag there, and the referee would just walk around and grab him and walk him back to the corner and make him put his hand on the turnbuckle or grab the tag rope. And to go right by, and that instantly, and if you did that once in a while, people picked up on it, and then you saw nobody making bullshit tags. There was no backslap tag. There was, sometimes the heels would even try to tag the foot to get heat, right? And and start to come in, and the referee go, what the fuck are you talking about? Well, I tagged you, tagged his foot, idiot. Get out of here. But uh, again, there were no backslap tags. There weren't any tags of the toe. The toe. There weren't double tags where you got a six-man tag, and you tag one guy in, and then he turns around and tags the other guy. And here's another rule that nobody pays any attention to anymore. You used to be, have to make contact. When a guy was tagged in, he couldn't turn around without touching anybody and tag right out. He had to make contact with his opponent before he could tag out again. And then when a heel got tagged in against a baby face, he didn't want to fucking touch. He'd jump out and the referee would count to get him back in. It would get the people involved where they'd be screaming at him, get back in the ring. And then he would duck and dodge away from the guy, but the guy was closing in on him and somehow the guy would grab him but he'd come out of it and dive and make a tag and he'd get a ton of heat because he's a chicken shit. But now they can just turn around, tag back out and jump in. Eh. So those are really the only rules surrounding tagging, but it made it an art if you did it all right, especially the blind tags. Uh, the heels taking advantage of the rules, but still attacking somebody from behind or two on one. 
and the fans understood it because they they had seen it and it was clarified for them. And now it's chaos in the project pit, and nobody understands anything. And it's they're just making the shit up as they go along, and there's no art to it and no difficulty to it. And somebody will go back and they will see a rock and roll express match. And some baby faces did this tag teams. The guy on the apron, it was a bad habit that a lot of tag teams did. Even the midnight did it for Bobby. Eaton did everybody did it. When you're standing there on the apron, you would have your right leg lopped over the middle rope and put your foot on the bottom rope. Cause that's kind of like a resting position, right? You've seen that, Brian, where they have the leg over the bottom or the middle right. rope. Yeah. Well, Robert Gibson would take tags like that and come in like that because Robert's legs were so long <laughs> that sometimes he had trouble smoothly navigating his way off the apron into the ring. So to give him about a half a second head start, he'd have that leg over the rope already. And when he took the tag and the referees would allow it because if some other the jabronis did it they'd probably yell at him in the locker room but since the rock and roll express were selling out everything everywhere and making a ton of money for everybody they let him do it but that technically isn't legal either but it's it is that difficult why is it so difficult because who's teaching it and who's enforcing it Goddamn, I just, in five minutes, I just, nobody's enforcing it, but I just told him in five minutes or less the, the fucking deal, and it's not like it's hard to remember. Okay, and the kid that's coming out of some jerk-off wrestling school in some random place, you think he's being taught any of that? No. And they're all coming out of jerk-off wrestling schools in random places <laughs> nowadays. There's the problem. Uh, but anyway, that's why I get, uh, again, I get upset because it's not that hard. It's a simple fucking rule. Um, it, it Every sport has rules, and when you follow them, it makes it look like a little bit more difficult of an endeavor that requires professionals to do, rather than just, ah, oh, we'll just make this shit up and act like we're playing in the playground. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, Brian, I think that instead of a wrestling school, they just need somebody to talk to. These, these modern wrestlers, somebody to bounce some ideas off of, somebody with a level head to say, I don't know what you're thinking, but you need to think again. What do you think? It's a good idea. Well, I guess they could call better help. Folks, if you need somebody to talk to, to bounce something off of, just to tell them what you're thinking or plotting or planning and get a, a diff different grown adults opinion on it or possibly some input on how to help you sort through your feelings the folks at better help can do all those things better help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist that you can start communicating with in under 48 hours because it's professional therapy done securely online not in person they've got a broad range of expertise which may not even be locally available in many of your areas, but this service is available for clients worldwide. With an account you can log into, send messages to your therapist, and schedule weekly video and phone sessions. If you have a crazy idea about a brand new way to tag your partner, run it by a grown adult first, or anything else that's preventing you from achieving your goals or interfering with your happiness. And right now, folks, you can visit their website and read the testimonials that are posted daily. Go to BetterHelp, that's H-E-L-P, BetterHelp.com, slash J-C-E, and join the over 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional and get 10% off your first month's services at the same time. Uh, just an offer for our listeners, BetterHelp.com, slash J-C-E, 10%. Off your first month's services. I, you know, we should have had some type of counseling available at wrestling school to the young wrestlers who are confused and conflicted about all the different things that they're hearing and the, the conflicting uh, lessons that they are being taught. So better help. Maybe it could be the official phone line of all young wrestlers trying to figure out what the heck are the rules of this sport anyway.
Better help. Better help. That's right. You better help. Someone better help this show. Oh, for heaven's sake, is it that bad? You're going to make me want to... Normally, we follow a rigidly <laughs> adhered to and strict format with with time constraints and everything, but we're just free-flowing today. Can you tell any difference? You asking me or the audience? <laughs> I don't know. I, Alice. Alice from Long Beach has written in. Al get out of Hold on. Stop right now. What? Alice from Long Beach? That's what it says, Alice from Long Beach. Yeah, okay, let's hear this. Oh, are you talking about, no, the other one wasn't in Long Beach. No, that's my hometown. So my hometown and your crazy Long old Long Beach, California? Oh, okay, that's a different Long Beach. I thought you were from Lido Beach or something. Well, Lido Beach and Long Beach share the same zip code, 11561. Well, that zip code gets around with everybody from what I hear. She's been around more times than a carousel. Anyway, hi, Jim and Brian. I've wondered for a while now about what were the incentives and or disadvantages financially to being a heel before the time of guaranteed contracts. The babyface would obviously sell more merchandise and participate in a lot more public signings and events when kayfabe was still a thing. Did the booker compensate the heel out of pocket for lost revenue, or was it just an unfortunate side effect of being in a villainous role? Oh, boy. It has, I guess, been a long time, Brian. And the younger folks, they don't remember. Well, you shouldn't be so exacerbated by this. There are people who are curious, who genuinely want to understand and know about wrestling history, and it has to be explained to them. Well, yes, but we've 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 come this far. The in the territory days, and I will say up until 1990. Let's let's put the cutoff there. Whether you were a babyface or a heel, personal appearances and or autograph signings in a paid form were almost non-existent for anybody. Now, as Vince started in the mid-80s with the expansion and then Turner Broadcasting got involved, they did come up with uh, uh, sponsorship campaigns. Remember when <laughs> Flair and Luger and all those guys were wearing the Ruse tennis shoes because they were based in St. Louis and Heard knew somebody? Shoes for your feet, pockets for your stuff. Yeah. What could you get in Fucking, that pocket? And bankruptcy for your company. <laughs> I don't know. The only thing you could get in those pockets on those shoes was probably a fucking tab of LSD to take it and forget the fact that you were watching Ric Flair wrestle in St. Louis in fucking tennis shoes. He was hot that night. He was like, they went to St. Louis for a house show. He was in a main event and they wanted him to wear the ruse to wrestle in. Can you imagine Ric Flair with his custom made color matching tights and boots and robes? And he's going out there like his, he's in a fucking outlaw mud show wrestling in tennis shoes. He was goddamn pissed. He's lucky Heard didn't say, instead of woo, say rue. <laughs> and he's like, what are we going to do if we break our ankles in these things? But anyway, um, point is, in the territories, you are correct. The heels did not do any autograph signings or personal appearances because they were heels, right? Nobody's supposed to want their autograph and nobody's supposed to want to go see them in person. And if the, the people that would go see a heel doing a personal appearance at some business in town the day of a show, they'd probably go to start trouble anyway back in those days. So the heels would sign autographs for the fans if there wasn't a big group of fans to see them, if you got them one-on-one -on -one at parking lot or the convenience store or whatever, some heels wouldn't even sign them then. But there was no events of any kind for heels like that. With the baby faces, a lot of people don't remember, merchandise tables just became a thing. Really, in it, it started in Tennessee, as far as I can tell, although... Every wrestling promotion always sold programs or sold something, t-shirts, something related to the promotion. And every once in a while, there was guys from the early 50s with the network TV. Vern Gagne had a wrestling game marketed nationally and had a 
you know, some of the guys got things like that, but traditionally, Gene, go ahead. I was going to say Gene Stanley had a ton of stuff that he was doing himself. Yeah, you know, he he marketed and merchandised himself. And, of course, the Destroyer, Dick Beyer, with Destroyer and Dr. x Mass in the 70s, he put his own ads in the magazines and sold his own merchandise through the mail. He was an early one, but most of the territories sold their own shit, programs, magazines, whatever the fuck. Uh, they weren't concerned with making the guys any extra money. And the, it, it really in Tennessee with what Christine Jared started doing with my pictures. And then later on, when the boys took them to the Memphis end, that was the first territory that really a lot of the guys were getting money from merchandise and it still was only the baby faces, but and then it became as during the latter half of the eighties in a lot of the Southern territories. And we carried this over in Smoky mountain wrestling. The guys could make enough extra money selling their own pictures and t-shirts and shit that they could afford to work in your territory when business started going to hell because of Vince and everything. And so that was extra income for the baby faces. And in th that case, sometimes not all the time or probably even most of the time, the baby face would give a kickback to the heel he was working with for helping get him over so he could do those kind of Tracy Smothers did that for the dirty white boy in Smoky Mountain. <clears throat> but anyway, it was at, at that point. Did Ricky and Robert do that for you in Smoky Mountain? No. Are you fucking kidding? But at, at, at the same time, the later, the latter half of the eighties and then into the nineties, the smaller territories that were still hanging on, that's where the baby faces started selling their own merchandise and the promoter started letting them go for it on a widespread scale because it was making them extra money where that they could afford to keep that, that talent. Again, the, the personal appearances, there were no wrestling fan fests in the territory days. There were no paid appearances, except if, if a local promotion got a sponsorship with a car dealer and the car dealer may say, hey, if you'd send Bill Superstar Dundee, or they did it here at Winter Furniture in Louisville in the late 70s, sponsored the show on Channel 3, and they paid some money to have Jimmy Valiant one time, Bill Dundee another time. They never got Lawler. I think he just didn't want to drive all the way up here on a weekend to come and sign autographs. And they, because it was so unusual... There were, they were there for hours. There was a line at one point that was like half a mile down the road. But that was few and far between. In more cases, uh, appearances for baby faces in the territories were, hey, we're going to be in Webb City on Saturday. Stop by the Dairy Queen. We're going to do something in the parking lot with the radio station. And they just tell her, yeah, get there three hours early. <clears throat> you know, go do a free remote in the radio station or in the parking lot with the radio station. And I'm sure Dairy Queen will give you a couple of burgers. There wasn't any, that was part of the duty you had as one of the guys on top or whatever to promote your matches. So it was a lot of that stuff in places like, you know where Web City is, don't you, Brian? I have no idea. No. Web City, that's halfway up a spider's ass. And that's uh, and that's uh, actually in the territory days, <laughs> in the territories that ran two towns a night. You'd have one main town that was a regular town to run all the time. You'd have another town as a little shitty spot show somewhere, the buttermilk run, the B towns, and in some of those territories, when guys knew that they were all in the same territory, but you wouldn't see a friend of yours for like a couple of weeks because he'd been on the buttermilk run. And then finally you see him, he'd say, you'd say, well, where you been? He said, well, I've been, been working on top in Web City. Nowhere. But anyway, that, uh, again, there were no wrestlers making any appreciable money for personal appearances or live autograph sessions before the mid-80s and for a while after that for most guys really ever in wrestling you made your money through the payoffs from the houses which is why that that was the overriding thing of importance to make sure the people bought tickets and promote hype the match promote the show take care of the protect the business 
because that's the way we're going to make money is the more people buy tickets, the more money we're going to make. And that's the way it worked. Now, if there weren't guaranteed contracts and guys were just paid on the houses, nobody in wrestling would be making a dime except for the people in the WWE and the people in AEW that were on top and figured in to draw in the house. But there's merchandise and there's autograph signings and fan fests. And since now everybody can be a wrestler, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities for that thing. That was not the case in the territories. But again, who, how would you have had time? You're working seven days a week, sometimes twice on Sunday, six days a week in the small territories. Where are you going to do any personal appearances? Anyway, more psychology, Brian? Would you like a little more psychology? Yeah. What was the ring psychology behind certain territories making throwing wrestlers over the top rope illegal? We have, we, it's come down to asking a simple question like that now. Again, I'm not trying to make anybody, and this is from Garrett. Yeah, that, that's nothing that's out, out of the normal as far as the question, because I grew up in the Northeast where we didn't have that. As soon as I started seeing stuff that wasn't WWF, I didn't understand it at first. Well, all right, you have a good point there, but also, the, but the answer should be, it's like the why is my wife question. The answer should be kind of obvious. It was to create a rule that the heels could break and to make a common bump more dangerous. And I mean, that's the whole point of a, a, a worked sport. And it's the point of wrestling to make things seem as dangerous and as important as possible. If even if they really aren't so that you don't have to subject yourself to things that are really dangerous. So top rope rule was they didn't do it in the Northeast and they didn't do it in the Midwest. I get a personal preference. I don't know. Maybe it was just the, you know, the AWA style. They, they had looser ropes. <laughs> it was easier to go over. I don't know why that they didn't make being thrown over the top rope illegal in those places, but in pretty much every NWA territory, which comprised at one point the rest of the country besides the Northeast and Midwest, Chicago, AWA, Chicago, et cetera. If you throw a guy over the top rope, as, as, the, as it was explained by the announcers and or the uh, promotional representatives, the promoters, figureheads, commissioners, whatever, if you're throwing a guy over the top rope that's 8 to 10 feet above the concrete floor, it's dangerous. Somebody could be seriously injured. And as a result, we're banning that. If you throw your opponent out of the ring purposely over the top rope, you'll be disqualified because it's too dangerous. We don't want that kind of shit going on. But then you've got a rule that you can play with. Well, he charged at me and I ducked. He went over the top. I stood up, but I didn't throw him over the top on purpose. And they would actually have people make rulings. Maybe a, a, a title change would be nullified because of this, this loophole. He, he, and then they, they announced that uh, the NWA had agreed that a man, the rule is a man must have control of his opponent's body when he goes over the top rope or elsewise it's not a disqualification. That leads it to a judgment call on the part of the referee. So you can... A simple thing like that can play into finishes. Also, a simple thing like that in a tag team match, they're getting heat on a baby face. As soon as the heels make an illegal fucking move of some kind that brought, draws the baby face opponent in and the referee's putting him out, they turn around, they chuck the baby face over the top rope, the place comes unglued. The people are jumping up and down, screaming at the referee. When the referee turns around, he threw him over the top rope, disqualify him, disqualify him, because they want to see the baby faces win. <clears throat> and they don't want to see the heels win. They want to see them lose, and they just cheated. Again, it's a way to have rules in a sport that you can then exploit for easily understandable conflict, and it's the same thing as jumping off the top rope. 
in the Northeast, that was legal too. And in the AWA, that was legal. But in the NWA, that was a disqualification. You could jump off the second rope and drop an elbow or a knee or a leg or dick or whatever. But if you came off the top rope, then that was an automatic disqualification because that was likely to cause serious injury to your opponent. And the wrestling commission did not want that to happen. Especially if you've got a guy like Ray Stevens that can do the knee off the top rope and then the guy fucking bleeds from the throat and that causes it to be banned or whatever the fuck. And then, same thing, the heels can do it behind the referee's back and the people go ballistic. I've seen people have to be restrained from by their family members from hitting the ring because Dennis Condry did a double sledge off the top rope to build Undie when, when they were in a tag team match because it was illegal and the referee didn't see it. All of the psychology behind all of these things was to make it easier on the boys physically, make it look and sound and appear more dangerous to the fans, have rules that made the promotion sound like they were trying to stop heels from injuring people on purpose and have heels be able to break those rules in such a way that would incite the fucking people to want to cut them and stab them. And all and it all worked just exactly like that because people understood it because it made fucking sense. Did I cover everything, Brian, on I, those? Uh... I think so, yes. All righty. And also... Before we get to talking about this week in wrestling, which will just take a second, I got an off-topic email. Should we talk about the off-topic email, or should we talk about the incredible feeling you have when your nuts are shaved? You know, let's talk about that incredible feeling. Because I just recently took my Manscaped Ultra Premium collection out of my cabinet in the bathroom and went to town on my body hair, it looked like somebody had shaved an orangutan by the time I got finished. Because I did the chest, I did the crotchal area, the taint, and I even, now that I'm lighter than I used to be and more flexible, I even bent over and, and ran it across the Hershey Highway and cleaned out some sagebrush. And now I am feeling slicker than cum on a gold tooth and just, just clean. And you can too, folks. Have, have we told the folks what's in the new Ultra Premium Collection from Manscaped, Brian? I don't recall if we have. I think we did on the drive through We haven't done it on this show. Real quick, the cologne-infused Ultra Premium Body Wash with aloe vera and sea salt. It'll keep you feeling clean and moisturized. And the body wash is cologne-infused, so it's going to help with that septic tank stank you got on you and the aloe vera and sea salt makes it taste great the perfect seasoning i'd have put a little cracked pepper in also also the two-in-one shampoo and conditioner well it shampoos and it conditions so you got that going for you and when you hop out of the shower Continue to battle that body odor with the Manscaped aluminum-free deodorant. No, you won't smell like a stinky aluminum can because there's no aluminum in this deodorant. And it's also cologne-infused. Are you noticing a pattern here, Brian? Apparently, most of the American public stinks like a man eating from under cheese in a septic tank of a slaughterhouse, and Manscaped is trying to single-handedly battle that problem. Also, the hydrating body moisturizer spray comes in there and a free gift of the Manscaped Lip Balm to keep your lips moist and smacky. And, of course, the Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer to clean off all the unwanted body hair and take your tumbleweeds. And, and actually, I always put a towel down. When I shave my chest in the mirror the water goes down the drain or the water, the, the, the hair goes down the drain and it clogs up and the water can't go down the drain. So put a towel down, some kind of drop cloth 
when you hit yourself with this lawnmower 4.0 and shave all that fucking funk off and then just ball it up and throw it out the back window. That's what I usually do. Anyway, folks, right now at manscaped.com, have I made it sound appetizing? You can get 20% off and free shipping the new ultra premium collection or anything else at manscaped.com by using the code DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, that's manscaped.com. Use the code DRIVE to get 20% off and free shipping. Brian, have you have you manscaped yourself lately? Are you indeed slicker than whale shit in an ice flow? I have not, and uh, I don't know why I'm answering any of this. You're doing the Bigfoot thing again. Why did you? I'm not doing the Bigfoot thing. I haven't manscaped lately. You said lately. You put the word lately there. Well, if you go more than two or three weeks, you start getting a lot of that undergrowth coming back up and the tufts of things coming out of your orifices. You know, they they got a trimmer that can trim. The only thing that they don't do is is, is a, 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 at Manscaped, they've got the nose hair trimmer. They got the, the lawnmower that you can trim everything. They've even got uh, the, the fingernail scissors. They got the, you can trim everything. The only thing they don't have is a dick lengthener. If they had that, then they would have the male naked body all completely taken care of. You can make the things that you want shorter, shorter, and you could make the things that you want longer, longer if they just had that one extra thing. Manscaped.com. Well, and Brian, this will scare the hair right off of you. There's big news in the action figure world. We were talking about that earlier in the program. My brand new action figures from the Incredible folks at Figures Toys go on sale on Saturday, April 2nd at noon Eastern at JimCornette.com and also at Figures Toys Wrestling Superstore. And by the way, I neglected to mention that if you go to JimCornette.com right now, as you hear this, you will be able to hear, hear, see banners on the front page with pictures of the new bloody variant figure and the Jim Cornette commentator playset. But I digress. Here's the news. Figures Toy Company has announced that all ROH action figures and replica championship belts will be retired as of March 31st. Apparently, due to the new ownership of the company. And uh, apparently now those are going to be collector's items, folks. I'm telling you, the Figures Toy Company figures, no matter who they are, you got to grab these things. But now they're... uh, ceasing the former figures line either because they don't have any wrestlers under contract anymore or apparently maybe tony might try to restock the promotion with wrestlers and then make figures out of them and you know when you think about it brian it's going to be easier for figures toy company if a lot of the aew wrestlers go over and and wrestle in ring of honor they can just do life-size replicas and they'll still fit in the same blister packs and everything It'll be so much easier. They don't have to scale it down to a seven-inch figure. They can just make them normal. Same thing. So this is my last chance to get the Gary Juster Strip Club playset? That's right. That's going to be discontinued as of March 31st. Damn it. Well, son of a gun. If I only had time. And it still comes with those little bitty dollar bills that you can stick in the little bitty garter belts. Of course, Gary Juster looks crazy wearing a garter belt, but that's beside the point. (laughs) Anyway, so we got got that piece of news. I'll just get off the news now. But uh, I have another email from one of the listeners, and then we might actually have to talk about some wrestling. This is from Mikey from Ottawa, Canada. And this is off topic. He says, I'd love to know what your favorite music slash bands slash artists are. Could you do me the honor of sharing your favorites with me? You know, and and this is one of those questions where it's an essay question. It requires me to do research because I don't want to just speak off the top of my head because I've got the OCD about the top 20 or who's the best or who's my favorite or whatever. And I'm like, how can you narrow these things down? But what I thought, because you have the music industry background, Brian, that you might enjoy this topic. I went to my my bookcase and I looked through my CDs and my albums 
and I just jotted down who I have the most, who's represented in the world of music, most in my album collection, my CDs, my books on their biographies, etc. Because you know me, I love one-hit wonders. And I love obscure artists that have done great songs, and I love other you know, groups that have done one or two things here and there, but I'm not into their whole catalog. But I thought, who have I got the most of that would be informative in some fashion, right? <clears throat> I love the Outlaws. Ghost Riders in the Sky is one of my favorite songs and the all-time greatest uh, Southern rock guitar anthem. Greengrass and High Tides. But once you pass that and there goes another love song and Ghost Riders in the Sky from the Outlaws, then you've got, eh, it's all right. The Brothers Johnson. I love Strawberry Letter 23. I can listen to it anytime, day or night. But then after we pass that, and ain't we funkin' now, ain't we funkin' like we like it, and a nice instrumental, they did Street Wave and a few other things, eh, it goes down. But some people you can listen to all day long. They got the hits coming out of their ass. The Eagles, Leonard Skinner, Aerosmith, Elton John, The Stones, The Allman Brothers. Those are the kind of things. Should I, make, should I just read the whole list of who I jotted down is on my shelf? Yeah. Eagles, Leonard Skinner, Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, Allman Brothers, Pat Benatar, loved her to death. The Beatles, Hart, Journey, Kansas, Jimi Hendrix, Earth, Wind, and Fire. I have every single album that they ever produced and a number of them on CD too. Rick James, Aerosmith, Elton John, the Alan Parsons Project. I will listen to anything that Alan Parsons did, especially the entire Tales of Mystery and Imagination album. Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band, the Jacksons. Not the Jackson 5 necessarily and not Michael Jackson, but the Jacksons. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm curious now. Are you saying just when they went to Epic Records and they lost Jermaine? Yes. Or are you just, okay, so not just yes. overall as a family, that specific period. Yes, because they all grew up and got to be adults, but Michael was still sane, normal, and, kids. And, and reasonably black. And <laughs> it, it, for about three years there, shake your body down to the ground, the fucking, the whole nine yards. Blame it on the boogie. Blame it on the boogie. That's the best one. And then, and and Michael Jack, uh, off the wall, to me, was better than Thriller. But off the wall and Thriller, and then he went out of his mind. And then you've also got, you got Boston. I love somebody that has so much OCD, it takes them six years to do an album. Chicago and ACDC. There's a lot of that stuff on the, on the, the, uh, the shelves. That's a pretty good cross-section of classic music. But then again, there's also, you know, I'd, I'd love to get the Dillard's Greatest Hits album. I understand that, the, that Dooley is on that, but I haven't got that one yet. Oh, there's still time. Who did I miss, Brian? Any, any surprises there? Any, anybody uh, you thought that... Uh, no surprise. It was somewhat of a pedestrian classic rock radio station list. Pedestrian? Yeah, I'm not surprised by any of it. Did you say Pink Floyd? Well, I'm sorry I didn't jot down Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd also. Okay, I was surprised they wouldn't be on your list. No, I'm not surprised. No, I just put them on the list. I just forgot them. I'm just saying in general, I wasn't surprised by your list at all. No. You sound like you're trying to make fun of my taste. I'm not making fun of your taste at all. I enjoy the music of almost all the groups or acts that you named. You it's just, just ain't that impressed. It's just, you know, I, I don't know. I think for a lot of people, it goes a little deeper. Oh, so I should be smarter. Not smarter, but... <laughs> Not smarter, but more intelligent. I mean, there was nothing punk rock. That's, that's correct. Right. So yeah. that's, that's a major omission. That's a, no, that's, that's, a, that's a major positive. Upper death. Give me thumbs up or thumbs down. We'll do this quick. Iggy and the Stooges. Eh. 
What the mm. hell was that? That's not thumbs up or mm. thumbs down. Okay, thumbs down then. I, I might tolerate it, but I'm not going to seek it out. The Velvet Underground. Oh, God, give me a song. I'll give you a, the lead singer, Lou Reed. That Well, Lou Reed, yes. I'll walk on the wild side with Lou Reed, but I'm not going to dive deep into the Velvet Underground's fucking whole catalog. But here, like, here's my question. You said you like one-hit wonders. Do you see Lou Reed as a one-hit wonder? Because to a lot of people... No, it's me. just the only song that he ever did that I heard that I liked. Okay. <laughs> I know he's had other hits. Well, actually, I don't know if he's had other hits, but <laughs> you know, he had other good yeah, songs. Well, there you go, yeah. then. Well, you're, but you can't judge everything based on hits. Or misses. You know what they say about the Velvet Underground's first album? It only sold like a few thousand copies, but everyone who bought one started a band. So there's something to be said for that, where you have the influence, even if you're not acclaimed at the, in the time that you release the work or sell any copies. Or it sounds like some of these trampoline cowboy wrestlers that uh, see a cool match and then all of a sudden 400 guys want to be wrestlers and do the same shit they saw in the match. You don't like the Ramones? I like Rocky. <laughs> you like Rocky the Ramones? Right. <laughs> it took with me, me a second. Took me a second. <laughs> <laughs> you like Rocky the Ramon? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we got past that. Um, yeah, we sure did. So now there was some wrestling this past week on television. Can I go through Raw real quickly? You ain't gonna believe how quickly. I wish I could have gotten through it as quickly. Yes. Well, if you saw anything I didn't, feel free to speak up. But Raw, remember in the 90s, Raw is war because somebody noticed in creative services that Raw spelled backwards is war. And so they went to Bridgeport, Connecticut and got a bunch of, you know, uh, fucking wild dogs. Actually, they didn't need to get a bunch. They already had them in Bridgeport and they shot all that war footage on the streets of Bridgeport and made it Raw as war. And that was exciting and did big ratings. Now they've got raw is monologues. And as we all know, monologues spelled backwards is sugolumnanam. It doesn't have the same ring to it. So on raw is monologues this past week, we got a Kevin Owens promo to start the show. Then a Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins promo where they began, even though they've been partners and friends over the past several weeks, and we're not sure whether they're baby faces or heels because they act like heels, but they fight other heels. And they were bickering because they, they didn't win the tag team titles, so they were going to have a match at WrestleMania. So now Owens has challenged Steve Austin to be on the KO show because KO hates Texas and, Austin ain't happy about that, but now Rollins is upset because he doesn't have a match at WrestleMania because Cody apparently is still coming, but they can't announce it yet. And that's the rumor is what they're holding Rollins back for. So now Rollins and Owens have an argument and decide to have a match against each other with the winner to interview Steve Austin at WrestleMania. Well, they didn't decide to. The whole thing was Kevin Owens was against the idea. Seth Rollins and whatever this ridiculous character is wanted to do this idea, and then Sonya Deville just decided to do it. Well, the point is they've got two of the biggest stars on their television program. That they, it's one that they just signed for. Well, now that we're here, and it's a it's a little under two million rather than almost three million. But what's a million among Canadians with Owens? And they, they're a team for a few weeks, and then they have a match against each other to see who wins to get to host a talk show with an actual real star on the pay-per-view. And so Owens won the it's, match, obviously. It's exactly the kind of thing adults would argue about. It. Exactly. <laughs> And Owens won the match so that he can interview Austin so that Austin can give him the stunner or whatever the fuck's going to happen. And now, if they are indeed saving Rollins back for the debut of Cody Rhodes, then Cody is going to go into WrestleMania to face a fucking loser that just got beat by his tag team partner on free television. Seth freaking Rollins is one of the worst gimmicks. I don't even know what kind of gimmick it is. I can't describe it. 
other than it makes me not want to watch. What is it? What is... Does he enjoy a party that isn't there? Is he trying to be like the adult-sized Gargano in NXT? What is his character exactly? I d- they've changed him and his world outlook and the way he dresses and the way he talks and his nickname and everything else like five or six times over the last few years. And every time they do it, there's like a week or two in there where he kind of looks like and acts like a normal person and you kind of start well he's not too bad and then he goes so far over the top with whatever the fuck they've got him doing now that you're back in the same place it's like what the fuck is going on here and combined with the fact that this program now is just three hours of people just going out and not even cutting promos that might be interesting but just going out and reciting scripts and uh, so and, Owens is good at it I'll give him credit He's he's actually really good at it because it doesn't always feel it well, you can always tell it's scripted, but he makes it feel like its own, at least a little bit. You can believe that Kevin Owens is saying shit that's insipid and uninteresting and that you wouldn't <laughs> really want to hear. You can believe it from him. Do you think there's so, any any way Steve Austin walks to the ring at WrestleMania or is he driving that truck all the way down to the ring? I wish I wish he'd drive the truck all the way down to the ring and run the ring over and knock it over and disrupt the talk show and just stunner everybody. And the people say, well, <laughs> we can't top that, folks. Good night from WrestleMania. The, the multiple dead bodies may be a hard <laughs> yeah, issue to get right? past. Yeah, just also. leave chaos, right? <laughs> chaos in the in the project pit. The project pit. <laughs> so that was raw. That's what I got out of three hours was that it's just, it's so, and, and NXT is same that now Ms. TV is on NXT. And that was the first 15 minutes of the program where Dolph and rude came out and then LA Knight comes out. And I, you know, uh, under normal circumstances, I would want to see Dolph Ziggler against LA Knight. It would be a good match, but since, they basically beat the shit out of Dolph, minimalized him on their main program. Then because he's an incredible worker, they send him to the developmental brand to win the title, to get some of their top guys there over. But LA Knight, who A, is the best worker probably top to bottom in NXT, and B, doesn't need to be in developmental, and he's already in his fucking 30s, now they're just feeding him to, you know, another guy. It just, eh. A kid debuted. A kid. Oh, I and didn't get Boy, to s- is he. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I didn't even see the promo package. I don't know what he looks like. I haven't seen him. What was it? He's the same size as Kushida. And he works like Kushida. <laughs> he looks like he's a 12 year old kid and he won with a springboard backflip off the top rope into a flying DDT where when he grabbed it, they all just fell in a fucking heap. One, two, three. Let's look on the bright side. At least that was the finish. It, I have a feeling it would have been anyway, because poor Kushida, he, you know. Anyway, uh, the one thing about NXT that I came away with was the Tommaso Ciampa promo. Did you watch this part? I did not. I missed this. Okay, this is the only thing that I... Because I just... It was Champa coming out, and remember, he's been the black heart, and he was a heel, but he's also been a baby face, and they like him, but he's always the serious, tough, kick-ass guy, no nonsense, right? And the piercing eyes and the great look, his work has been great. But in this one, he came out, and he sat on the top turnbuckle for a while, and he talked about gratitude and how grateful he was to the fans there. And, you know, all of the original NXT guys that are still there that come out and do one of these promos, they come out and they talk like the asteroid is coming, and they're all saying goodbye to life on Earth. And this was, it was like a retirement speech. He went over his NXT career. He thanked the fans for being there for him praised all that they did together the fans started chanting please don't go where it it, they're making it yes in ovw when that was the developmental program 
the fans of OVW were sorry to see their favorite wrestlers leave because they couldn't see them live every week and couldn't talk to them and couldn't get their autograph and blah, blah, blah. But they wanted those guys to succeed and to go and be big time TV stars and make money and be on big pay per views. Of course, then, as we've mentioned, they would get upset about every time their favorite would get some stupid gimmick goofiness and it would you know nick dinsmore became special needs and the bashams were emasculated and matt morgan became a stuttering idiot all the top guys became but at the same time the ovw fans didn't hate seeing these guys leave go to the main roster as much as not only the nxt fans but the nxt wrestlers it was like it this was a verbal a suicide note from Champa because he's apparently going to go to the main roster because he's been doing dark matches or whatever, but not only are they acting like it's a a moment for bereavement, but they're actively getting the NXT fans in their building to to not want these guys to go to the main roster and to fucking look on with horror as it happens because of the this in original NXT black and gold versus 2.0 thing. Yes, they fucked up the whole promotion. They made a clown show out of it. They stripped out all the talent. They made it look like a goddamn kaleidoscope of unicorn vomit and bad 90s WWF gimmicks. But are the talent supposed to come out and actually actively help foster the opinion and the fans in the building there that they're leaving to go to their dooms. It's the same company. It's a, it's the checks are coming from the same place. And Tommaso wanted to know his perfect fairy tale ending. Because well, remember he was going to go to WrestleMania weekend as NXT champion a few years ago, but he got hurt, had to relinquish it. He was going to do it again, go to the big NXT show WrestleMania weekend, but he lost last week. So he said, then he said, is there a perfect way to close this chapter? I wrote, is there any way to close this promo? And finally, Champa says, thank you to the people. And then Tony D'Angelo comes into the ring. He just appears. He's behind T Tommaso. And he's got a crowbar. <laughs> And he does his best Joe Pesci voice like he's in a, a community theater version of Goodfellas. And he's got, you know, who do I got to beat to put Tony D'Angelo in the history books? Who do I have to pay to make Tony D'Angelo history? So he wants to throw hands at Tommaso Ciampa at Stand and Deliver. And Champa agrees, gives him his hand. They shake the hand, and Tony D'Angelo knees him in the nuts. And then promos Tommaso and then kisses him on the cheek because he's a gangster, remember. And after that point, I was like, you know what? I'm not interested in the rest of this program, and I skipped Ziggler and fucking L.A. Knight because what the fuck? It, it, so Tommaso Champa comes out and turns out he's got a heart of gold, and he's sniffling because he has to leave his fans. This was the, the fucking badass that was kneeing everybody in the next week a few months ago. And now he's just wandering, drifting aimlessly in the WWE universe. Like a lost astronaut on a spacewalk. You didn't miss anything, is what I'm saying, Brian. Well, I feel better about not watching it now. I don't know what... I, I just... <laughs> If if I had had anybody in OVW go out and cut a promo with that dreary a, a picture being painted of what, without actually coming out and saying it in so many words, of what is going to happen to them when they go to the main roster, I would have heard from fucking Stanford the next day, you can't do that shit. You're making us look like assholes. Their own developmental program is making their... And, of course, Raw doesn't need a lot of help looking like shit. But their own developmental program, is to their fans, is making the fucking main program look like 
purgatory, which it is. <sighs> you know what, Brian? I'll tell you what. Every wrestler in NXT needs to make sure that they do one thing. Just in case they need it, they, make they need to make sure to keep their cars in perfect running condition in case they need to jump into them and make a quick getaway, don't you think? Yeah, actually, I think this is one of the best pieces of advice you've had on the show today. Yes, I agree. That's right, young wrestlers or anybody. If you never know when the shit may come down and you need to hop in your car and get the hell out of Dodge, I've worked by this uh, all my life. I always have a car key in my pocket to a working automobile within easy reach so I can get the hell out of any situation. And folks, if you want to do that same thing, you got to make sure your car is working properly. You've got to go to rockauto.com. Folks, there's all kinds of makes and models of car now. And as you see, famed rap star Iced Coffee does these commercials where he says you can't just fix anything with a wrench anymore. Now it's rocket science. Well, you need the parts to fix your car. And with all the makes and the models and the multiple varieties, you can't just go to one of these shade tree auto parts places out on Main Street and get everything. They can't possibly carry all those multitudes of parts. That's why you go to rockauto.com. They are the, the place to go, the center of the universe when it comes to car parts for every make and every model. Cars, trucks, motorcycles, boats, bobsleds, they can fix anything, folks. And they don't have different prices for the professionals, the people with the N, and the do-it-yourselfers. They're the same for everybody and reliably low. Because some of these parts, holy mackerel, you can find different things to do with them. You can. You can soup up your Chevy Chevette, or you can make an automated uh, egg beater and put that motor on it. It'll just whip that stuff. You know, holy mackerel, you can make and invent all kinds of things with these car parts. Even if you don't know how to fix your car, just buy some car parts and just put them together. You never know. A lot of great inventors started that way, didn't they, Brian? Just bolting and nailing and screwing shit together without any thought to what they were going to come up with and boom there's a computer well no usually there was some thought put into it and there was uh actually probably a lot of thought put into it i don't think that's how any of that happened no rockauto.com is a family business they've been serving auto parts customers online for 20 years so you can go to rockauto.com and as i said shop from hundreds of manufacturers great prices reliably low why spend up to twice as much for the same parts and if you go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car, truck, motorized tank, amphibious machine, or tinker toys, you can write JCE in the how did you hear about us search box so they know that we sent you. You won't get a deal. You're already getting that. But at least they'll know that you came from us. All the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. But Brian, what are you doing this week over on your side of the world in the Arcadian Vanguard Network? Another action-packed week on this side of the world on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. This week on Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, available at suawpod.com. Or look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, wherever you find your favorite podcast. His guest, Dr. Tom Pritchard, the doctor of desire himself. Yay! Check it out today, approved by Jim Cornette. Once again, Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, suawpod.com. Also want to make mention of the latest Patreon episode for patrons of Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry at patreon.com slash Baldrin and Barry. The boys continue their talk with Max Payne, the long-lost Max Payne, Man Mountain Rock. Find out all about his career and what's going on. Once again, patreon.com slash Bowdrin and Barry, or look for Breaking Kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! There's another one you held back somehow. I don't know how you... Yeah!
And you hurt yourself on that one, too. I uh, Maybe. Go through the archive today at 605pod.com. New episode coming soon. But I uh, go through the archive, 605pod.com, or look for the 605 Super Podcast, wherever you find your favorite podcast. The Mothership. The Mothership. All right. And before we get to our watch-along, which will main event today, because everything else has certainly been preliminary action, uh, we got to talk about AEW's program Wednesday night. Again, we'll try not to dwell on this, but there were... <laughs> You know, for a while there, I thought they could be turning a corner, and now they, I see they've turned that corner, and they're heading hopelessly down a blind alley. Uh, I'm going get to get to the Hardys in a second. This was just so disheartening. But the opening match, another six-man tag match. This time, it's Adam Page, Jungle Boy, and Dino Douche against Adam Cole, Bobby Fish, and Kyle O'Reilly. Be careful what we asked for because we got it. We wanted the Undisputed Era reunited. We said, wow, this is going to be great. We didn't get the Undisputed Era from NXT. We got the, what is it, PWG version of all these guys where they go out and play with their friends. And I was pretty sure this was going to be unwatchable. And I started trying, and yeah, you, it, it, the six guys flipping for no reason. The corpse referee was involved, so every move that they had ever seen with no logic or common sense or continuity or reasoning took place with tags until there were no tags, and then there were some more tags, but the referee's so useless, it doesn't matter anyway. And the, at one point, they set up a stunt which one of your kids called him tricks? They do no, tricks. No. Some guy emailed us about that, that his kid called the tricks. Ah, well, this was a stunt where all three of the baby faces got up on the turnbuckle at the same time and all did moonsaults off onto each heel individually in different directions to where it looked like one of those synchronized diving exhibitions. I expected to see the colored water shoot up out of the pool. It, it was 20 minutes into the show before this thing was over with, and it was just unwatchable. And, you know, I, the one I feel the worst for is Kyle O'Reilly because, as we talked about, he really has something different and such a different style, and it lent itself well to an MMA kind of fighting thing. He trained in that, and now he, you know, it's – this is just ridiculous. And there's no, there's no wrestling. There's no attempt at wrestling. It's just the, the show. Anyway, I did. Did you see anything I, different than I saw about that match? Or did you even, could you bother to be, to look up and pay any attention? It just all looked the same for 20 minutes. O'Reilly stood out to me too. Just like you just said. And in fact, him and Fish doing some of their double team stuff was great. I was like, oh, man, I'd love to see them get some good tag teams. Jungle Boy looked good. I don't like the, whatever you want to call it, the makeup of these kind of matches, the layout of these kind of matches. The only other things I'll say is Adam Cole continues to not impress me in AEW, and Adam Page just is not a fucking world champion. He's a great intercontinental champion. Go by, like, the 1990 standards. World champion, intercontinental champion, tag team champions. He's a great Intercontinental Champion. Does not feel like the world champion at all on that show. It doesn't feel like there's a strong top guy. Take like Punk out of the equation. The AEW world champion doesn't feel like a strong top guy. No. And we knew this. That's what we, we knew this was going to happen because they... Again, they botched the booking for years and the tag team with twinkle toes and the dork order and the whole nine yards. We've gone over that ad nauseum. But then when we realized that, my God, they literally are going to pull the trigger on this and make him the world champion, despite all common sense and reasoning to the contrary, when Punk came in and Danielson came in, we thought Cole was going to be a big deal. Now he's a non-entity. But there were other choices that people would have accepted and would have come off like a world champion instead of an 
unconfident intercontinental champion, but they never gave this guy a chance. The booking was rotten. And then since he won the title, now he's getting a few wins, but he's in six mans with middle card guys. He's still associating with the dark order. And he's still trying to talk everybody, including himself, into taking him as a world champion. And it, it's not, now he's in a six-man tag on free TV in the opening match. So, uh, um, I skipped some other stuff. I was just going to the important, important, to the most important uh, uh, points in this thing. William Regal comes out on color for Moxley and Danielson's tag team match. I said, okay. I'll watch this. Yes, it's against Wheeler, Yuta, and Muffin Top Taylor and the rest of the best friends. Normally, I skip that just to avoid heartburn. But with Danielson and Regal involved in this, I watched it. And one of Regal's first line was, Man in the mask, you're, you've done nothing for me. <laughs> when he was thanking JR and Tony for all he'd done for him. And then he asked, Who is the demon at ringside? And they couldn't say he's Danhausen and he's very nice and very evil. That's it. Cause nobody knows cause nobody's figured it out yet. Cause nobody's told anybody. Why is he just there? Who is he to anybody that doesn't live their life on the internet? Danielson and Moxley jump-started it and kicked the shit out of Yuta and Muffin Top as they should have, but here's the problem. Again, who are the heels? We, it, it, because even though that the best friends group is a joke, they have been presented pretty consistently as the baby faces. But now they're in the ring against a team comprised of the best in-ring heel in all of professional wrestling over the last few months. And Moxley's been presented as a baby face, but he doesn't wrestle like one because he's always fucking trying to kill people and drink their blood or whatever. But that team is managed by the most beloved figure now maybe in AEW, William Regal, who just got jacked around by the other company, and I would think every AEW fan would throw themselves in front of a bread truck before they'd let it hit William Regal. So who are we supposed to be cheering for here? And what the fuck is the goddamn deal? Wheeler Yuta is wrestling in ballet leggings and tennis shoes. Um... Muffin Top has just given up and he's just wrestling in a t-shirt because you got to cover that dough up some kind of way. Um, so again, you know, Danielson and Moxley beat him up as they should have because they're job guys and Danielson and Moxley are top guys. But then, just as I mentioned that Regal and uh, noted to myself, Regal and Danielson are making Moxley more palatable to me. He's keeping it in the ring. He's actually working. This is twice as long as it needed to be. But then at, at that point, Yuta just stopped selling and bowed up at Danielson. <laughs> and they hit him with umpteen things and he kicked out and the people started chanting, Yuta, Yuta, who are we fucking pushing here? If you think uh, just because major main event stars allow an underneath guy that has no victories under his belt and is associated with job guys to do a bunch of shit to him to where the people start chanting, Oh, you to you to that's not getting you to over in the long run, just in front of him. Yeah. We like that. He's kicking the shit out of the, the top guys makes top guys look like idiots. And then Danielson stopped him and my, or stomped him and Moxley choked him and he tapped out. And then Regal comes in the ring and all the Stooges, the best friends start to leave and Regal calls Yuta back in and <laughs> slaps the shit out of him and tells him he did a good job. I, I mean, if that, if that helps Yuta get away from the best friends, I'm all for it because, you know, in a year or two, Wheeler Yuta might grow up and become a nice little wrestler if he's been with Pockets and Muffin Top and the rest of them all that time. 
he'll probably still look like shit. Did you see anything I missed in this one? No. But now we have to, wherever this thing with Danielson and Moxley is going, I'm pretty sure we're going to have to endure Danielson working with Moxley coming up rather than Danielson and anybody else that we'd love to see better. You know, the only shame about this whole thing, and I'm willing to see where they're going, maybe it ends up being a really cool faction where you kind of have Danielson as the disciple of Regal, and Moxley's kind of like the Rick Steiner in 88, (laughs) weirdo talking to his hand. You know, maybe it'll all work. But they really had something great with Danielson as a heel. I kind of wish they would have kept going with what they were doing for several weeks in a row. Not that he's not that guy anymore, but I don't know. He was out there. This is... This is really distracting from it. Yeah. I don't know why you would change anything that Brian Danielson was doing because he was the best in the business, frankly, almost anything, except that, again, we've seen that when Tony has ideas and a year and a half later, when it's finally time to do it, he will still do it even if it makes no fucking earthly sense in current day. He will still, he put the belt on Adam Page when there were half a dozen reasons not to. He's probably, before Moxley went to, on his little retreat, they probably had this idea. So now he's going to ignore everything that Danielson has done to stand out and still shoehorn this thing in because that's what he intended to do. He cannot change his... Vince can't stop changing his mind. Tony Khan can't change his mind for money. Did you love the lengthy backstage interview with FTR this week? Lengthy? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. It lasted all of 45 seconds. Tony Schiavone's in the back with FTR. They fired Tully last week because he quote unquote lost focus. And then the Hardly Boys walk in and make faces and do funny voices. And so again, <laughs> no Briscoes. Yeah, That's what the they truth. did. They That's made they, they made face childish faces and and did funny voices. And then they forty five seconds and it's over with. So now we don't get the Briscoes. We're gonna get this so the Hardly Boys can beat FTR again and make them look even worse just by being in the ring with them. It's an insult at this point to Dax and Cash that they have to... It's like grown men in a sea of of grade school children, and the children are just walking up and pissing on their legs, and they're not allowed to do anything about it. So so now (laughs) we get this. Uh, I don't know what the Dax and Cash either one did in a previous life to be cursed like this. But can you imagine how shitty it is to be the absolute best at what you do? And every you're so far ahead of everybody else in your company that you're not allowed to do it because it shows everybody else up. And so then you change companies and you move to a different company where you're supposed to be allowed to do these things because you're so talented, and they book you into oblivion and let teams that are even worse than the ones that you had to put over in your last job, fucking, you're putting them over now and standing there and letting them fucking piss in your mouth. And we are all being deprived of seeing tag team wrestling. Instead, they're showing us Jungle Boy and Dino Douche the Hardly Boys, and the best fucking friends. Hey, this Ring of Honor. That could be where Tony has his tag team division that's not booked by the Bucks. But it's still going to be booked by Tony. I'll take that over the Bucks. Take out the influence of the Bucks. The division might be all right. It would have a different makeup, different roster. Some of those teams would be there. Some of those teams wouldn't be there. But I would take that over the Bucks. And then we also get these childish, like, again, Junior Varsity Monday Night Raw backstage interview segments. Everyone stand at a weird angle so the camera gets you. Everyone have a weird confrontation that goes nowhere. Bad acting from the Bucks. They love that. If that's how FTR is going to be used there, hey, do something with them in Ring of Honor. 
the current Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions. Do you know who that is? Oh, that would be the Briscoes. Briscoes. So if it's not on TBS, maybe that's where we get some real tag team wrestling. Briscoes, FTR, and Ring of Honor. Do you think, okay, well, are they going to keep the t- the TV time slots on the Sinclair stations? Because if not, then where is Ring of Honor? Oh, you're asking me to reveal everything I know. I understand. I see how this is going. <laughs> I'm just saying, what, what are we going to see in Ring of Honor? How are we going to see it if it ain't on television? Maybe they could put Ring of Honor on Friday nights at 10 o'clock instead of that crummy fucking scrub show they've got. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. I think somehow, in some way, unless Tony completely flames out, Ring of Honor will exist as a separate entity. I I continue to wait to see where it's going to be aired. And then if if that's the case, then maybe you're right. Maybe the the Hardly Boys would say, okay... Tony, you can you can have the Briscoes and FTR if it's over there on that TV show that nobody will be able to see compared to ours so that people won't know that we suck and we're a couple of immature jack-offs and these guys really know how to have tag team wrestling matches. Maybe he, maybe they'll allow give Tony permission to do something in his own company. Maybe they'll allow it. Eh, I wish the next thing hadn't been allowed. Are you a member now, Brian, of the Jericho Appreciation Society, JAS for short? Now you see the problem with trademarking too many things in a short period of time. You're trying to get everything into one promo. Oh, my God. (laughs) I don't know what. Again. It's like it's like everybody's on drugs and you're in a, a dream state. So Chris Jericho and this group have just switched heel. He's been a baby face for what, a year, year and a half. Now he's just switched heel. The ideal thing to do here would be to take Judas away from him because that's the sing-along. The fans love to sing the song. So if you were serious about becoming a heel, then you would take the song away from him. But no, he's so fucking egotistical that he's playing the song so the fans are cheering and laughing and singing the song of the heel. And then when it's over with, then he starts doing a promo. Well, actually, he didn't start. First, the hyperactive 2.0 guy started. And then the other one took over. But the talking about how Jericho should be idolized and they gave him a big introduction. And now Jericho's he's being the over the top egotistical heel after he's just encouraged everybody in the building to cheer for him and sing along with his music. Then he's got to expose the business too, because he takes credit for everything, including I quote angles and storylines. You'll never forget. Yeah. Believe me, we won't forget the goddamn, the fucking swimming around in orange juice with the the company mascot or fucking around on the football field, like an idiot when you were supposed to be the veteran superstar that would teach these young guys some respect for the business and how to get over and draw money. And instead you just became a jack off fondling yourself, trying to play with the cool kids to make up for your losing your hair and expanding your waistline. Anyway, these men in the ring appreciate him. That's why they're the Jericho Appreciation Society and the rest of the roster are just pro wrestlers. Not a sports entertainer like him. Well, okay, we said this was obvious, especially when he tried to trademark that. And I'm it's going to be interesting to see if he can trademark a phrase that Vince McMahon has been using for 38 years. But he says pro wrestlers like it's an insult. And like you would want to be a sports entertainer because he knows that those fans will boo a sports entertainer because they equate that with WWE and cheer for a pro wrestler. But the problem is most of the people that he's calling pro wrestlers are bigger fucking sports entertainers than he is. So, and then Garcia jumps in and says, I'm a sports entertainer too. Yes, everybody hates sports entertainers. But you can't 
get heat by calling yourself a sports entertainer and calling these other guys wrestlers when they're doing even sillier, stupider shit than you are sometimes. Because they're not... So, this went forever. He got in his... All of his trademarks. And then he decided to change 2.0's names... (laughs) I don't know what they were before. I, he said 2.0 was bad creative, he said. I don't know what their individual names were and don't give a shit. Uh, but now their team name is not 2.0. Their names individually are Daddy Magic Matt Menard <laughs> and Cool Hand Angelo Parker. Oh, those will fit right on the marquee. Well, a rose by any other name still stinks. Um. So then there's Jake Hager standing there, and he looks like one of those people that had electroshock therapy for psychiatric issues in the fucking 60s. They've melted part of his brain, and he just stands there. If you look closely, and it's a high-def TV picture, you can see drool coming out of the corner of his fucking mouth as that blank stare. He looks like Tucker Carlson. Somebody on Twitter put two, two shots of him up side by side the other day. He said, I know I've seen that bewildered stare somewhere. And Jake Hager's facial expression looks just like that weird look on Tucker Carlson's face when he doesn't understand something, which is every 14 seconds. And they let Hager talk. And I swear to God, he stood there And I wrote, did he just Daffy Duck? Brian, did Jake Hager (laughs) say, we're the, something like we're the Jericho Appreciation Society and we beat up Pro Wesslers? Pro Wesslers? (laughs) Is that what he said on television to me? And Baba Wawa came in to, inter- to interview him. He did, in fact, say that, and I believe he does, in fact, have some sort of speech impediment. Well, I'm not trying to make, but I, I, has he talked before and we didn't notice it? Or is this just honestly the first time he's ever spoken? I know I've heard him speak before because I've heard the lisp before, and I thought that may have been why they got Dutch to be his manager. I'm talking about on AEW television. I never actually saw any of the WWF stuff when he and Dutch were together. I have saw pictures. I heard about it, but I never saw any of this. Yeah, I don't have any idea how much talking he's done in AEW. I don't remember him talking. So after he said, we beat up Pro Wesslers, Jericho's closing line was, and that's entertainment. No, it wasn't. It was a long, indulgent promo with people speaking, except for Jericho, that nobody cares about. And Jericho saying shit that didn't make a lot of sense because it's all some some kind of reverse psychology that's reversed itself so many times they ended up where they started. And so now we have five bullshit sports entertainers in a group a faction in a company full of bullshit sports entertainers <sighs> where's punk is punk all right he knows the weeks to take off <laughs> he knows there's the episodes like, to miss there's not an amber alert out or anything is there he's we know he's okay he's safe he's not sick he's not hurt he's not missing he will be back He just judiciously didn't appear on this program so he wouldn't get anything on him? Possibly. Next up for the TV title, Wardlow against Scorpio Sky. Scorpio Sky, of course, just won that title. What was it, last week? Yeah. Okay. They started out, I thought, okay, remember I've said good things about Scorpio Sky in the past. When the company first started, he and Daniels and Kazarian, they had some good matches with people. He looks like he's an athlete. He can fucking go. Wardlow, we know, is a a future budding star. He looks great. He's got the fucking idea. He needs experience. His promo last week wasn't, they didn't set the world on fire. It wasn't rotten but he needs some confidence there, but okay, here's his TV title match already. 
Guy just won the belt last week. Okay. And Scorpio Sky has Dan Lambert and Paige Van Zant and Paige Van Zant's husband at ringside with him. And was there somebody else? Ethan Page? Was he there? No, he wasn't there. They Ooh. could fucking they could send him to the sports entertainer companies where he can do more green screen. I wouldn't miss him at all. Um, but the point is Wardlow and Sky started out in the first 90 seconds, 120 seconds. They had a good little match going, a big baby face, smaller heel type of thing. Everything looked normal. I'm like, they're taking their time. They're not rushing. They're not doing anything stupid. I'm like, okay, we might have something here. And then Scorpio Sky is out on the floor and Wardlow's going after him. And Paige Van Zant walks right up and gets in Wardlow's face. Now, okay, I know with today's environment, you can't have the baby face snatch the heel woman and just toss her aside or punch her out or whatever. Back in the territory days, that used to get a big pop. But why does he have to stand there and look at her and put up with her jaw jacking when he's in the middle of a match and he could have just walked around her and gone on about his business? She's not going to stop him. But he stands there and lets the girl tell him off. And then he starts to say, but her husband gets in front of Paige Van Zandt and is telling Wardlow, like, what are you going to do about it? Well, there's the perfect place to drop the husband like a fucking hot potato. But instead, Wardlow stood there and looked at that. And then Paige Van Zandt's husband turns around <laughs> and grabs Paige and starts kissing her. And Wardlow standing there watching that. <laughs> and then <laughs> the Scorpio Sky does a drop kick from out in the ring outside his baseball slide type of thing and, and catches Wardlow from behind and stops him. And they go to, that was the break spot. I don't under, and I know Wardlow's not been around long enough where he would know any better. So he's doing what he's told. And I know Paige Van Zandt and her husband don't know what the fuck they're doing in this business. Or Lambert. One would have thought that Scorpio Sky, being the veteran in this equation, would have said, you know what, that's going to make you, Wardlow, look like a complete fucking moron. As you're coming around the ring, if Paige Van Zandt, if, if they even wanted to involve her there and why, I don't know. If she gets up in, in your face and you just say, phew, fucking hook her under her arms and pick her up like a little baby girl and set her to the side and continue on your way, and there's her husband and sticks his finger in your face and you drop him with one punch, and then Sky's gone around and comes in and hits you with the baseball slide. Now you have removed two obstacles from your path, but you got jumped from behind by the fucking guy you're fighting you don't look like a complete imbecile for standing there and watching these displays of whatever go on but nobody brought that up <clears throat> so they come back from the break and they've got the heat going on wardlow after a girl made him look like a moron and he's a brand new baby face but then he makes the comeback and they went back and forth a bit but wardlow hit him with a choke slam and then the power bomb, and then number two, and then number three. And the people love the power bombs. The power bomb symphony. And then after number three, Lambert jumps up on the apron and Sky rolls to the floor. I don't, I don't know why they had to do three and then he had to roll to the floor. He's still able to roll after three, but nevertheless, so here comes, as soon as Sky rolls out to the floor, the whole thing falls apart. Spears comes out carrying not one, but two chairs. The whole match stops. MJF comes from behind at ringside and runs Wardlow into the ring post and dazes Wardlow. And as he rolls into the ring dazed, Scorpio Sky, who just took three power bombs comes in from behind him and rolls him up one, two, three. So now 
Wardlow has lost his first match on AEW because of MJF. I get where they're going there. But then Van Zant's husband comes in, who, as far as I'm aware, has never had a worked wrestling match in his life. And he gets on top of Wardlow and starts throwing. They had an old saying back when I first got in the business about the old timers. So I got in the business 40 years ago. Guys then were talking about the guys that got in the business 60 and 70 years ago. And they had a phrase with some of those guys, their punches look like shit and they hurt. And that's a double negative. You don't want bad looking punches that also hurt. But this is what I think this kind of was, fake forearms that Wardlow was blocking with his his arms because you didn't want this fucking non-trained, non-working guy to just throw straight punches to your face like should have been going on in that angle. So he's throwing the fake forearms, but he's probably got some juice on him enough that he's bruising up Wardlow's forearms. Then Wardlow fights back. And MJF is shits himself and is about to leave the ring, but he catches MJF, and that's where Spears hits him with a chair. And then they get more heat by all these heels. And then MJF comes out with a stack of money and pays off Dan Lambert, puts on the diamond ring, and nails Wardlow with the ring as the other heels hold him up. This went forever. There was no referees. There was no security. There was no bell ringing. There was no... There was no... The only thing the announcers could say was, well, Wardlow doesn't have a lot of friends in the locker room because of things he's done, and he's been with MJF, so nobody's coming to help him. Do you have to be friends with the referees? Do you have to be friends with security? Are you friends, Brian? If you're getting mugged on a street corner and a cop comes by, does he say, well, I can't help that guy. I'm not friends with him. They had untrained green people Involved in this, there was too many moving parts. They distracted from the main issue. Fucking hell. If Lambert's going to manage Scorpio Sky, put him in the corner, leave Paige Van Zant and her untrained, goofy-looking husband to do something else because it didn't fit here. They just got in the way. Spears with two chairs coming out and blah, blah, blah. Good fucking God. You've got a heel with a manager and you got a baby face. You need to fuck the baby face. And you got his former employer, MJF, coming down with a fucking diamond ring gimmick. You can't figure out how to get that job done without involving Paige Van Zant and Scott Spears or Sean Spears or Stan Spears or whoever he speared, as well as it was a mess. I hate to say that about stuff MJF is involved in, but it wasn't his fault. MJF need to be there. Wardlow need to be there. Scorpio Sky need to be there. Lambert in the corner for a distraction. Everything else was ridiculous, and the ending went on so long forever that if any heat that it did get was bad heat, not good heat. It wasn't heat like, oh, we want to see those heels get their ass kicked. It was heat like they expect us to believe this would really fucking happen. What do you think? I agree with a lot of your criticisms. I think if there's anything to look at there that I thought was interesting was the crowd actually during the match. It seemed like they thought it was going to happen and they were ready for Wardlow to win the TNT belt. So there's a natural thing there for MJF to screw him out of that title if you're going to keep the belt on Scorpio Sky for some reason. And boy, that's that's heat. Those people were ready for it. And then they didn't get it. And then it went on for a while. And again, I still am of the argument that Sean Spears takes down segments because he's so goofy. He's the Brandon Cutler of the MJF segments. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was, su- I was surprised. You know, I'll see where they're going with this. I was surprised that this is where they went with Wardlow, that he... Got pinned by Scorpio Sky. I know his TV. first loss yeah. in the company is to Scorpio Sky. Um, out of nowhere. I but again, I'm sure Tony had this idea a while back, and he's not gonna change even when he sees things moving in another direction, he can't recognize it. 
And I just want to say one other thing. I've always said on the show that, you know, Scorpio Sky to me is one of those guys that's pushed the way he is because of how popular he is with certain guys behind the scenes more than with fans or anything else. I will say, I always get a little bit of pushback from people in AEW who will say, I don't know what happens, but he's the most charismatic guy in the world behind the scenes. <laughs> You know, so there are some of those guys. Like, they you know, say the same thing about Brad Armstrong. That's what I was going to say. He there was are those so guys. hilarious and such a personality, but on camera, it just, he didn't, it wouldn't come out. But nevertheless, after, so basically Wardlow <laughs> loses his first match. He's knocked out with the diamond ring. All these heels just willy nilly uh, allowed to run rampant on him. And at the end of this whole segment, the announcers pitched, up next, the Hardys are back together. Like, up next, the weather report. <laughs> <laughs> and therein lies the problem. Matt and Jeff Hardy wrestled the next television match against Private Party, Mark Quinn and Isaiah Cassidy, Matt's old protégés. Matt and Jeff Hardy reunited in the wrestling ring for the first time, and what was it? Was it four years or five years? however many years it's been, the reunion on free television, not pay-per-view, the reunion match against underneath guys, not main event stars, was announced via a press release from Tony Khan at 2.30 Eastern time the afternoon of the fucking show. Oh, I didn't even know that. I didn't see yes. that. <laughs> oh, I saw it on PW Insider. It popped up. Guess what? Tony Khan has just released a press release. The Hardys will be wrestling tonight in five and a half hours on free television. Oh my, none of these people have ever been involved in promotion before. Hey, Brian, the greatest thing that's ever happened is going to happen tomorrow at three o'clock and tickets are only $2. The problem is if you only hear it, the next day after it happened, it doesn't matter how much the tickets were or whether it was free or what happened because it's already over with. That's why when you have something like this, you build it. I talked about an angle they could have done to make the Hardys reunion and confrontation with the Hardly boys, their doppelgangers in that company, and people would have probably been interested in that. They didn't do that. They decided we're going to start the Hardy Boys off with an underneath tag team. And they'll find out why that nostalgia has a law of diminishing returns and you start with the hottest thing you can and you work your way down rather than the other way around. But then they don't even build it for a pay-per-view or even a, a, a future date that they can advertise on free television or do promos for a week or two on TV building up to it, where, my God, can you imagine what's going to happen when the Hardys get back together against so-and-so? Tony Khan sends out a press release five and a half hours before the bell rings. Yeah, the Hardys are going to be back together. <clears throat> so all the people that saw that press release we're already going to be watching that television program because anybody watching for the wrestling news between three o'clock and eight o'clock is already going to be watching fucking AEW and already going to be seeing that program. But all the people out there who have given up on wrestling, who used to be Hardy boys fans who might, I don't know, crazy go wild theory, watch to see them again after all these years. They probably heard about it two days after the fact because they don't live their life on the wrestling news sites because wrestling is such a letdown and a fucking tragedy for them anymore. So Hardy's versus private party. And now after being a weaselly crooked manager who steals money from his guys and signs them to outlandish one-sided contracts and 
and or the guy that teleports himself and changes clothes in an ice machine, now suddenly he's his normal self again, dressed like they used to dress when they were the Hardy Boys. Apparently he's had one of those shock treatments. Got him back in the right frame of mind. Maybe he went into one of those ice machines and he's able to come back out as his old self. Alternate dimensions. That's right. Should be lowered expectations. Um, They did all the Hardy Boy stuff and the people popped for Jeff just breathing or grabbing a headlock. If Jeff looked at him, they popped. Not so much for Matt because he's been there and they've gotten tired of him because he's not done anything interesting at all. And if he had sympathy when they gave him brain damage, tried to kill him in those matches. And then they made him an underneath manager with wishy-washy fucking talent. And now it's like, no, unless it, it was again, it was like, remember Sid and Spivey when the skyscrapers had that pay-per-view match. Spivey'd get in, and they don't care if he fucking saved a baby from a burning building. They farted at it. Sid got in and farted, and the people gave him a standing ovation. That's what we had going on here. And I just, I'm gobsmacked. They wasted this on a bullshit TV match because the Hardys are as hot as they're going to be. That's what happened when a team gets back together. That's that people have been waiting to see like that in the anticipation. Now's the time to strike because they're in their forties and they're not going to get any more over with what they can do in the ring. It's just not going to happen. Not with them or anybody else in that position. Tony Schiavone said that Matt and Jeff Hardy had had more than 700 matches as a team. They've been in the business 25 fucking years. That was two years worth of matches for the Road Warriors or the Rock and Roll Express or the Midnight Express. Certainly to God, he just pulled that statistic out of his ass and that's not real. How can they have only teamed together 700 times in 20-something years? That can't be right. That can't be right. So anyway. Um, now they, they've seen the Hardys. The, the now, the new is off of the reunion aspect and they can barely handle private party because this was competitive and they got heat on Matt. Mark Quinn almost killed him with that cannonball dive to the floor. Did you see that far from missing him? He fucking flattened him. Well, I think, and, the, I think the Hardys got even with any slights they felt with Jeff Swanton. Mm, at the end. <laughs> we'll get there in a second. But Matt hits the tag to Jeff, gets a big pop, even though it was a cold tag. It was a hot tag by virtue of the fact they just wanted to see Matt. And he makes a comeback, and they do a four-way, and they do an awkward setup to Jeff being up on top, and the announcers call, here's the swanton. He did a splash and got a two count. And then all the momentum came to a halt. And then they did a contrived gymnastic spot where the private party does that thing where they try to flip over the other partner on the apron and they come back in and skin the cat on a what the fuck. I couldn't tell whether the finish was fucked up and Jeff just went up and said, I'm not going to do the swanton here or what the fuck, but they did this contrived thing. But the Hardys hit stereo twists of fate and then Jeff <laughs> goes up to the top rope for the swanton on Cassidy. And I don't care if you've potated somebody in a match and they need a receipt or you need a receipt. That's one thing, but he could have killed this fucking guy. That swanton landed with every bit of his weight ass first on top of poor old Cassidy. Yeah. Was that what happened, or was it Mo Larry and Shemp, based on that sound effect? Well, that's, that's what happened inside uh, Isaiah Cassidy's <laughs> innards. Good God. And I mean, what would possess... I'll tell you what, if a motherfucker ever came off the ropes and landed on me like that, that'd be the last time I would ever lay there for that son of a bitch. And, I, and, and, and that's the way it used to be. If, 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 if there wasn't this just, well, I don't care how many people he lands on, 
or caves. And I'm not talking about Jeff Hardy. He's not noted for being, you know, in uh, just spreading injury and disease wherever he goes. But I'm talking about anybody. These guys, they just lay there for these guys to make this shit up. A double 450 degree cannonball or a twisting pike position or what? And there's no way you can even see where you're going. I would have laid there for Bobby Eaton all day long. I wouldn't lay in the middle of that ring for any of these fucking guys come off the top on me for 15 fucking seconds. Because they don't, they don't deserve the privilege of people giving themselves to them. Because they're trying to make it too fancy and too fucking, oh, well, now we've done the triple Lindy, so let's do it while blindfolded. Fuck you. What'd you think of this match? Is the bloom already off the Hardy Rose? Oh, I forgot. I forgot the afterbirth. Here comes Andre Oli Olio, Jose, the butcher, the baker, the bunny, for whatever purpose she was serving. The heels surround the ring with criminal intent in mind. More music plays. Here comes Darby and Sting out with a skateboard and a baseball bat, and nothing happens. And the heels leave. Now your thoughts on this match. Is the bloom off the Hardys already now that they've seen it? And see now that they're not the Hardy boys, they're the Hardy middle-aged men. I think whatever bloom there was is off the rose. Now they'll just be another popular tag team on the roster. But the problem is, this was how they were used for their first ever match. The other problem is coming out of it. It appears they're going to continue to work with Andrade. Yes! And the Butcher and the Blade. This is not in any way how I would have used the Hardy Boys if I had them on my <laughs> roster. You reunited the Rock and Roll Express. <sighs> yeah, I did. Who'd you book him against? Did, did you just book him against some... The fucking... Well, no, I booked him against Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden, the stud stable who were the number two heel team in the company so that they could win over them while the heavenly bodies were defeating... Bobby and Jackie Fulton, the Fantastics, so the two unbeaten teams would then go for the tag team title. And, and honestly, Ricky and Robert had a lot more time left to go then when I reunited them in Smoky Mountain Wrestling than the Hardy Boys do now because in case people... How old are Matt and Jeff Hardy right now? Give me their ages. I'll look it up. Because a lot of people may forget since Ricky and Robert had been on top for so long, they were still in their mid thirties when I reunited them in Smoky Mountain wrestling. I think what we, what did we figure? Robert was 35 and Ricky was 37. At one point we figured that, or was it, no, were they younger? We can oh, find that we can find that out in a moment. I well, have. Ricky Ricky is sixty five right now that he admits to. So let's just so that means that um, that basically Ricky Morton when he reunited in, uh, with Robert Gibson in Smoky Mountain Wrestling was thirty five or thirty six years old. Matt Hardy is forty seven. Uh huh. And Jeff is forty four. They're, so they're 10 years older than the Rock and Roll Express were when they reunited Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And That's the Rock crazy. And, That's crazy. I'm, I'm they just seem telling so you. much older. I know, I know. That's why I'm saying you're on borrowed time here. Nostalgia and the name value and the goodwill that the Hardys have built up over all this time in the wrestling business. Don't waste it. Don't show people that they can't do what they could do physically 20 years ago. Don't put them in the ring with underneath teams to give them a good win. Reunite them with a personal issue and put them in the ring with the top guys you can because your clock is ticking. And from this point forward, the more that people see the Hardys, the more they're going to be able to see through and see they're not what they used to be because of age and infirmity said we didn't get an Andrade promo. I'm starting to really get a kick out of those. I, You know, that's your perverted sense of humor. I should have figured you'd be something. You want me to make you laugh with my perverted sense of humor? Yes. After these Andrade promos? Here's something you probably haven't thought of. What the fuck does he talk about with Charlotte Flair? 
<laughs> what are those conversations? But anyway, I'll let you continue. You know, on I show. had a bee stink me. A bee, a bee. stink me. He enunciates stink. everything. <laughs> okay, so the main event was up next. And at first, I was like, what the fuck? Because I'm zipping through, trying to get out of the commercial break. And then I see the band. And I forgot they were in San Antonio, and that's Thunder Rose's hometown, because I'm thinking, how the fuck did this make it to AEW? I can see him having old Kingfish Ingram. I could see him having some kind of, you know, modern-day musician, but... Is that mariachi music? Was that a Mexican mariachi? I've heard the name mariachi band, and I know it's Hispanic, but I don't really know. The, I'm not an expert on the flavor of the music. To be very honest with you, it may have been, but I had the TV on mute during her entrance because I was on the phone. <laughs> you seriously, you should have heard they were playing and singing and a singing and a playing and a picking and a grinning. So it like eight women all in costumes, the colorful native culture played. And then Thunder Rosa came out. They didn't play her music. They played some music and then she had her entrance. It was Thunder Rosa and Britt Baker for the women's title in a cage match. And when they announced this last week, I knew what was going to happen. And I was obviously right. Again, these are probably, these two girls, if they had a match, could probably have the best match of almost any girls in this company, except Serena. However, they weren't allowed to have a match. They were, they were encouraged. I'm sure this was their idea. And they were encouraged by the loose nut behind the wheel of this company named Tony Khan to go and do what they did. I'm sorry. I don't, this is not sexist. This is just observing a fact. This is an observable fact. Girls' fights in steel cage matches look like horse shit. Because they, it looked like two, they could have been fine having a wrestling match and you can buy the girls wrestling, competing like athletes. When they're trying to be Harley Race and Terry Funk, it doesn't work. It looks phony. It's fucking stupid. It devalues a future main event cage match with blood that they could have with men on pay-per-view, not just men, but main event men, not the best friends who aren't men or the little cosplaying teenager fucking trampoline cowboys men they have, but actual men men. This is 220 pound girls as big around as a fucking my little finger trying to be Harley Race and Terry Funk and have a goddamn double juice brawl and it looks like shit. It does not look in any way like a fucking fight, nor does it need to because have we mentioned <laughs> they've already established they've got a Warner Media executive that will ban wrestlers from the company for mean tweets from 10 years ago. You mean to tell me that that's a no-no, but two women bleeding, hitting each other with chairs in a cage, and now with thumbtacks, is okay for Warner Media. Just no mean tweets. It was crap at the start, and by the they took a break, and they came back from the break, and Thunder Rosa was bleeding. After Britt Baker got a little color early, but she was hesitant with it, as she should be. Why does a woman want to cut her fucking face? They tried to get it. You saw but Thunder she, Rosa hitting that? Yeah, she was trying, and she was trying to knuckle it and get it open a little bit, and that's, you know... God damn. The biggest problem is that these fucking lunatics in charge of wrestling these days have told these women that they're supposed to be equal to the men and supposed to be allowed to do everything that the guys do, and therefore they do it. That's the problem. So she didn't get but a little color, thank goodness, but then we come back from the break, Thunder Rosa is bleeding, bad, and then they throw eight chairs in the ring. So I fast-forwarded. Now they have built a shop class project of chairs in a neatly stacked pyramid in the middle of the ring, and they're having a fake fight on the turnbuckle so that Britt Baker can take a bump on the chairs that I'm sure hurt her because the chairs didn't give. 
So then I fast forwarded some more and that's when they brought out the thumbtacks and I turned it off. They could have easily had Thunder Rosa win the women's title in her hometown in a wrestling match with Britt Baker that would have, I'm sure, got over because people already wanted to see Thunder Rosa win anyway. But instead, they do something that puts the whole entire wrestling business, male or female, on the same level as cockfights and the guy that bites the head off the chicken at the fucking fair. And not only that, but they did it. Has it, it was it last week or week before? No, it was on the pay per view. So 10 days ago, they just had MJF and Punk double juice, thumbtacks, chairs, whatever the fuck. This, it's a parody of wrestling. And I'm sure they're all proud of themselves because now the girls are equal and they get to have phony matches that fucking do damage to the wrestling business too. But yeah, I'm sure they were all proud of themselves, Pat, and see, the girls can do what the guys can do. Yes, have shitty matches that make the business look bad. I I, I don't know what they're... <laughs> That's another thing on the long list of things we can add that Tony Khan needs to do is tell the girls no more juice, no more gimmicks, no more stipulation matches. That's for the guys that draw the fucking money and not everybody up and down the card, whether they're male, female, animal, vegetable, or mineral. And cut it off. It's fucking embarrassing. What'd you think? Not a big fan of these kind of matches. I don't turn off the TV when I see the thumbtacks, but I certainly, at this point in time, I just lose my attention. It went past the point of being cringe and something I hate to the point where it's like a groan and a, oh, come on. And like you said, we just saw it. We, we see the and same real things over and over. They're real thumbtacks. And old referee Aubrey's rolling around counting in thumbtacks. Here's another thing. If I was the referee, I'd say, you got to be out of your mind. I'm not refereeing that shit. It put me in a main event with Brian Danielson and CM Punk or somebody, and then I'll fucking work at a goddamn ring filled with landmines. But if a girls match, I'm going to get thumbtacks stuck in me? Fuck you. The, uh, the one good thing I'll say is Thunder Rosa won the AEW women's title. It was very emotional. That was a nice moment. Yeah. It was nice to see. And I think she deserves, you know, she's the kind of person you could put a belt on and not have a problem with it. So I'm happy. Imagine, you know, the, the emotion she showed, if you could see her face instead of all the blood, can they could take pictures of her with the title belt held. Oh, no, they can't take pictures of her because they can't put them anywhere because there's a woman covered in blood. What kind of fucking uh, image does that give your company? So it was, it was a... It was a great scene for the echo chamber of modern cosplay wrestling fans that don't see anything wrong with women having a fucking garbage match in a cage with double juice. And I'm not talking about for anybody's, oh, I'm horrified a woman is bleeding. No, I'm horrified that something makes it harder for the guys to do their job, draw the real money, and have the real fucking fights. It's to this goddamn bullshit where... Everybody, man, woman, or child, trained dogs and cats can all go out and just because they can imitate wrestling moves means they're allowed to do so. It's embarrassing and unprofessional. <sighs> well, that was AEW Dynamite. Well, it certainly was. There was AEW Dynamite. That sounded like the sound of the AEW exploding ring. There it is. Yeah. How about this? Yeah. What is that? That was the bomb bomb. Yeah, see? All right, we've ended on an angry note there, but now we're back. Uh, people don't know, listening to the program, we've taken a break so that we could get our watch-along match queued up, and now since we ended on an angry note, I'm even more pissed off now than I was a minute ago because we're watching Peacock and to just simply try to fast forward to a specific match in one of these pay-per-views, every time you fast forward, you get 60 seconds of commercials that you got to sit through before you can do anything else. Have I mentioned that 
The WWE Network was nice, and I hate the cock. Have I mentioned that? You have, and you're not the only one that has said that, and other people agree with you. So this may be the last watch-along we ever do of anything on the peacock. Uh, We'll go back to YouTube like God intended in the future, because this is a pain in the ass. And also, (laughs) for all you people who have not watched any of the archived programming of the WWE on the peacock, When you go to hit the Royal Rumble, it gives you the seasons, season 14, season 15, instead of 1993 Royal Rumble, 1994 Royal Rumble, whatever. They don't even know how to fucking put the goddamn wrestling footage up and label it for a fan trying to find it because they don't give a shit because it's valueless anyway, because now, thanks to the WWE, Everything ever put on tape by wrestling promotions is worth five bucks a month. So fuck it. But we're going to watch this match, right? Right. Now, we've been promising a watch along for several episodes now. That's not the match we're going to watch. We promised a watch along when you thought of it. And I said, well, in that case, remember that for next week and we'll do it. And you didn't remember it. That's why we didn't do it. Maybe. Are you going to disagree with me? I'm a little distracted. I was trying to see the episode where uh, Paulie and the Midnight Express attacked you. I believe that was season four, episode 46. (laughs) Season four. (laughs) Of World Championship Wrestling. I didn't know if you knew that little fact. I wasn't aware of that. We didn't have seasons back then. Uh, But anyway, this is not the watch along that we said we were going to watch, but because of the events of this past week, we wanted to put something with Scott Hall into the equation. That's why we've come up with this, which is 1993 Royal Rumble, Bret Hart versus Razor Ramon. That's what we're doing here, right? So would you like to tell, since you helped me get through it, how do the people, if they want to watch this Watch along with us. How do they find this match on the cock? If you would like to find this match on Peacock, where we're starting, which is slightly before Razor Ramon's promo, or as they used to be called by fans, interview, right before that, there's a still of Bobby the Brain here in Gorilla Monsoon at 50 minutes, 54 seconds. 50 minutes, 54 seconds. That is the spot. You should be on pause. For some of you, it may help. Press pause before you go to the actual time you're trying to get to. That way it'll be paused when you get there. And good luck with the commercials. Yeah. Royal Rumble 1993, Season 6, Episode 1, as they call it on... (laughs) It's my favorite episode of the Royal Rumble. Oh, God. It's like it's a fucking Seinfeld rerun. Anyway... What have they done to our business? All right, should we do you're you're the one that generally calls this the countdown. So how are we gonna do this where everybody's in the same place and we're gonna watch this match and talk about it as we watch it? Once again, go to Peacock or if you have some sort of bootleg means, we don't endorse that, but uh hey, you know, whatever floats your boat. But on Peacock, Royal Rumble season six, episode one, Royal Rumble 1993, 50 minutes, 54 seconds into the broadcast. We will do a five-second countdown, and you're already getting me going. After I say one, I will say press play now. Once the word now is complete, that's when you press it. Not on the N of now, on the W, on the OW of now. Got it? Got it. The OW of now. The OW of now. 50 minutes, 54 seconds into the Royal Rumble. Jim, are you prepared? I've been prepared. Okay, well, let's do this. Five, four, three, two, one. Press play now. And Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan are calling the action. I never liked that setup where the announcers were up on a stage away from ringside. It made, uh, it made it, it seemed like we weren't in the middle of everything. Look at Razor Ramon. This is what he's, he's been doing this gimmick like a year. Maybe he's getting it down. Not even, not even. That's one of the most fascinating things about the whole thing. 
there had been so many guys brought in and their gimmicks just failed. Like, no disrespect to Steve Kern, but Skinner didn't work. Yeah. So many different guys in that era. In 92, Razor Ramon shows up right at the end of summer and all of a sudden he's in the main events. People don't really think about him as term, in terms of one of the great gimmicks that worked for Vince, but he did. He's one of the real great Vince gimmicks that instantly worked. So this is a few months into him being there. He had already been a tag team with Ric Flair at Survivor Series, leading to the babyface turn of Mr. Perfect after the Ultimate Warrior had to go away. And Bret Hart had just won the world title a few months earlier in Saskatchewan, Saskatoon. So he's a new champion. And we all think about Bret Hart now, and he's the greatest, and we love him. He was great then, but he was still kind of getting his footing as world champion. Yeah. And to a lot of people, he really didn't get that until the second title run, actually. That's right. He he was over as a single at this point. This was where he was starting to get to the next level, but he wasn't the the guy that he'd become just a couple of years later. But look at look at Hall here with the well, and now we go to Mean Gene with Brett. Um, what I was gonna say was Hall, he came down, he's got all the confidence. It's not a canned entrance, he's just doing what he feels. And like you say, you know, Hall had personality. And the reason I think why Razor Ramon didn't flop like a lot of those goofy gimmicks taken from uh, occupations or major motion pictures is because Hall had enough of that in him and was able to put enough Hall in Razor Ramon that it kind of became his and it didn't seem like a a fucking cartoon. It it seemed like that was the guy at, under there somewhere. Just like Brett. Brett's, he's standing there in a pink jacket, but he's not a cartoon character. He's a real guy. And I'm like, you know, that's when you can see Hall on his face. He was young. He had the fucking smirk. He's got the attitude there. You can, t even if this is a worked sport, and JJ at the gorilla position, but here was Jack Lanza uh, right over on the left side of the screen. JJ at the gorilla position on a headset. They did a lot of behind the scenes shit back then. I haven't watched these shows in ages because I was. Would you not have seen there. this? I mean, Royal I, Rumble 93, I, would you have watched it? I probably got a tape, a VHS, and probably fast forwarded through. There's Stu and Helen. And probably fast forwarded through a lot of the stuff. I remember faintly seeing this, but it's been, you know, 30 years ago. So I know I didn't watch it twice. Um, but, you know, that's these guys, even though they're dressed up and they're shiny and all the WWF gimmick and everything, they're grown guys. They look like something. They took themselves seriously. They didn't break character and wink at the fourth wall. And you could get into what they were doing because at that time the fans didn't know the extent of how things were controlled or manipulated or choreographed or worked or set up or whatever. And the guys still were, they were in a lot of cases allowed to go into business for themselves to make shit that they did seem like something they would do rather than something that was written for them. It was just a different feeling you got from these guys. And they didn't, th at no point did either Bret Hart or Scott Hall sit down and go, hey, this would be a cool move if we did this. Boy, the people would pop. Of course, they would see that we're cooperating with each other, but wow, what a bump that would be. They never did that. It was all about getting the match and yourself and the the issue over, not doing cool bumps for. And now he, Brett gives the glasses to the kid, so Ramon throws the toothpick at the kid. And here we go. And again, they're swinging and they're hitting, but they ain't hurting each other. But they act like they are because that's preferable than actually doing it and not selling it. And it, Hall is, he's, He's deceptively big. He's, like we said, 6'5", 6 6'6". 6 6. He's 260 or 70-something pounds here. Brett's not a small guy. But again, boom, the snap, the force. There goes Brett into that buckle, and oh, you can tell it hurts him. This is almost not even the same product anymore. 
they don't even care to try to go out and and make any kind of an impression like this is violence. It's tumbling, whereas this is supposed to be violent. Boom. He sells his knee. Now Brett can, the bigger guy, Brett can start working at the leg. Take his balance away from him. That's the way the smaller, more technical guy beats the bigger, rougher guy. Work on the fucking leg. Boom. Look at Razor Ramon. Scott Hall is selling right now more than... Did you see anybody on anybody's program last week on television sell like that? <laughs> and he goes for the figure four because he's working the leg. And Razor's in fucking trouble. If and look at how strong he is. He pulls himself to the ropes. Yeah, and pulls Brett with him by, grab, by you know, holding onto the legs. They're doing shit. There's action. There's motion. This is not a boring match, but they're not just running 100 miles an hour and diving everywhere. The referee's in control of things, and they're giving the perception of, of a contest that both guys want to win. This is not brain surgery but it's almost impossible to find anymore. Except when CM Punk wants to do an homage to Bret Hart's matches. And I mean, you know, and honestly, this was back in the days when Hall would sell. He, uh, Hall would always sell, but he, he's selling right now like crazy because he wants to get over. He's not where he wants to be yet. The 1997 Scott Hall and WCW probably didn't sell as much as 1993 Scott Hall in WWE and, and and Brett has a reason he's working a little heelish, but with all the stuff that R Razor Ramon's been doing and Brett's going after this goddamn bigger guy, he's going to work those legs. He's going to do what he needs to do. So in terms of Scott Hall or Razor Ramon and the WWF and click or the click and their timeline, the one, two, three kids, Sean Waltman would come in. I think four or five months later, and then it's about seven months later when Diesel, Kevin Nash, comes in. Yeah. So this is, really, this is him, you know, not the veteran in the WWF yet. No, he's he's by himself. He's trying to get his gimmick over and get him a place in the company. Boom! And I love, Brett could figure out all kinds of different ways to take turnbuckles and take ring posts. And now, see, Hall is still limping because he's had the leg worked on, but now he's in control. Look at Brett's face. He just got slid rib first into that ring post. And that's the tide turner that allows Ramon to get a little heat on him out here. Maybe he shouldn't be using his legs, but he doesn't know the story. Well, it was the other leg. It was the other leg that he was working on, but nevertheless... Um, you know, and, and look at Hebner is, this is Dave, by the way, not Earl. Um, it's, you sure? or is that Earl? Wait a minute. No, it, it's Earl. Yeah, Some it's bitch. Earl. Earl, Earl lost weight as he got older. Usually they get bigger. <laughs> Dave turned out to be the chubby when an Earl got skinny. Earl's a little heavier there. Anyway, boom. Now he, Hall's going to work the back. The back and the side and the ribs, that's what went into the post. He just gave him a couple of backbreakers. Again, this is not hard to understand. If, you, if your opponent has just injured a part of their body, start working on that. And then he's not rushing. He's taking his time. He was, he's gloating. What do you think of him now? The referees didn't have earpieces, so someone could say, hey, tell him he's got a wedgie. <laughs> But see, now Brett's going to sell and uh, and Razor Ramon's going to be all over him and he's going to slow the pace down a little bit because you want the heat to be a little slower and more deliberate as he systematically take that baby face apart. And is this the SOS? Yeah, boom. You know why they call it the SOS? The sack of shit. It's what you throw you the guy Helen like selling. Yeah. And you see the baby face's parents in the front row worried about him. Again, you know, 
they could have gone and started pulling furniture out from under the ring, but they, well, they would have been fired if they had, because people would have said, what the fuck are you doing? That's not called for, but instead they're working a match. So, oh, and again, I don't know how Brett and look at Heb slide down for that count. He could still move back then. I don't know why that again, so many of the guys seem to have a problem grasping this that you you don't want to run off and leave the fans, especially during the heat. You want them to feel what the baby face is feeling. You want them to sympathize with him. And now he's grabbed a hold so that they can see Brett sell and they can see the pain on his face. And at the same time, they're going to regroup because I would think as soon as, or about as soon as this abdominal stretch is over with, it's time for Brett to get a little bit of a hope spot. And they're probably not only getting the people ready to see that, but also discussing exactly what that might be. If Brett didn't go over everything ahead of time back then, there's always things you can call in the ring. And look at Hall knuckling his ribs. That's the same side that went into the post. And everything that Hall has done has been to work a back or a midsection. Now look at Brett trying to force that arm up, but oh, the shot to the stomach. When you slow things down where the baby face can sell, you also get the people ready to see the motion that they're going to see. When, and now the spin around and oh shit, he's reversed it. And they come up, see now, oh shit, but Ramon's still too strong. He swings him over. Brett's going to move because it's about time to do that. And now Brett, here we go. Try to grab a desperation headlock, fire off double knock. No, not a double knockout, just a tackle. I would think Brett would start firing up a little bit at this point, and then Hall can shut him down again, but they're starting to build it as they're going home a little bit more. Boom. Boy, it's weird to watch matches from 30 years ago that look like you remember wrestling's looking, and then you see what they've done to it, and it's almost a completely different product. You know, Bret Hart was always great, and he's always been one of my favorites, but he's one of these guys, and I haven't watched this match in a long time, and looking at his selling, and you know he laid out this match. Yeah. He's incredible. <laughs> he really is just the greatest. And now here's uh, Duck, boom, off, crossbody, little hope spot, and the kick out, and it sends Bret all the way out to the floor. So now he can't continue that comeback without having to fight for it some more. He's fighting back from underneath. Oh, shit. This could be it, but no. See, little little tweaks like that. Just when the fans think they'd, oh, shit, then they go, oh, shit. And then, oh, shit, oh, shit. He's keeping it fresh. And a near fall isn't the same if the guy's actually selling right afterwards as opposed to they get up and just go to the next near fall. Well, yeah. I mean, if, if you just do a near fall and then jump up and run 100 miles an hour into something else, it doesn't mean anything anyway. But if you're staying alive, fighting from underneath and selling at the same time, and now again, they're going to slow it down. They had the flurry of action. Now Ramon gets a chance to fucking heal a little more. The referee gets on him, and they're going to go into something else here in one second. And boom, in this case, probably, ah, a bear hug. And Brett loved these. Uh, they, and with Yoko, Yoko wasn't tall enough where he could really pick him up, but boy, he could squeeze you. And Brett loved these because the people can see your face, the baby face's face when he's selling, and the referee can do this now where the arm gets limp. But by number three, he's going to fucking stiffen it up. And then he's going to lean back a little bit and he's going to start fighting. And now the people are with that too. It's all about, and, and desperate times call for desperate measures. The baby face has to bite the guy on the nose. Look at that face. Brett looks like he's been drug across fucking hell. And there, the big momentum changer. 
It was everything that Brett could do to boost that big son of a bitch out there. And now here he goes. And a dive that makes some fucking sense. The guy didn't stand there and wait to catch him. He got up, turned around, and there was Brett coming at him like a fucking missile. And now they got to boom, rattle around ringside, and then get back in the ring because that's where you win or lose the match. And there they go, just that much. They weren't out there five minutes, didn't bury the referee. And now it's Brett's time to shine. And look at Bo, Bo, Bo. See, and, and Hall pushes him off like, no, get off me. No, fuck you. I'm coming back for more. And look at those punches. That's what I'm talking about. These guys throwing these pissy little sissy punches to a guy with his head covered up and hitting the forearms. No. Punch the guy in a fucking head. If he's too big of a pussy to fucking open up, grab his arms and make him. I hate when people block shit. Uh, guys that know how to work hate when they get blocked. Because then it just looks like shit. And look at Hall selling like a drunk man. And at the same time, this has all been stuff that you could do to a human being without them being carted off paralyzed, believably. And he's still selling it. And Hall's twice the size as most of the guys these days that won't sell it if they get run over by a truck. How do the fans know what any of this feels like unless we show them? Anybody out there in that crowd ever been vertical suplexed? No. So if they see one, <laughs> boom! I wish Hall would have turned around a little more. He might have seen that coming in time to fucking take it better because he just got plastered. But you, you, you tell the people what this shit feels like by your response and your reaction to it. That backbreaker, that hurt. Because I can see it on his face. And he's still down. Now he's coming up. He don't know where Brett is. Boom, there's the big clothesline. All I'm saying is we tell people by the response and the sell and the reaction, whether this stuff hurts or not or how bad it hurts. And what we've done is malpractice. All these guys, this shit looks great. The fans are with it. Fucking tempo is up. But everything still is within the realm of reason. Nobody's been hit 16 times with a baseball bat. And there, look at that. Brett hits the Russian leg sweep, but those bad ribs, that's hampering him. Oh, if he could have capitalized a little quicker, he might have got that pinfall. This is not just entertainment for children with fucking trampoline artists cartwheeling about. This is a story that's being told of a conflict amongst two guys. And he's trying to get the ropes. Brett's trying to go for the figure four. Razor don't want that to happen. Sharpshooter. Or sharpshooter, I should say. We did the figure four before him. The sharpshooter. And he still did. Look, he pulls Hebner's leg of his pants over on top of Bret Hart. It's not a referee bump. It could happen. And it wasn't contrived, but it got him out of that predicament. And again, just every, every punch they throw, the, the drawback, the follow through, the body language, the, the, the selling. This is what the art of wrestling is supposed to be, not stunts and tricks. And now if I, oh, it didn't he, he's going to go for the big belly to back off the ropes that he did, which was a huge move back in those days. Something you weren't going to get up from. Especially from him, a big guy. Yeah. And Brett, being resourceful, Babyface slips back, does his own, puts him down nice and flat, look nice, boom. That's a suplex, so we're going to sell it. Now it would be a double backflip off the top rope back suplex, and they'd be up moments later. Bo! Foot to the face. Look at how and, Brett went down. Yeah, and he's doing a lot for, I mean, obviously... Vince had plans for Razor Ramon ongoing. He's already a top guy and been pushed in this spot, but Brett's making sure that this guy that's only been here a short time 
is seen by the fans as competitive with him, who's been there as a tag team champion or now a top singles guy for what the past seven, eight years. And the razor's edge, which we showed that on Twitter a while back, somebody's doing a souped up power bomb version of this. And Lance storm said is a good way to give somebody a concussion. Ramon knew how to set guys down, but Brett reverses and hooks for the backslide. Almost. So, boom, got to go back to those injured ribs. And at this point, um, you know, this, honestly, for a WWF match of that time period is pretty doggone good. If you really think about it, every main event or, well, in this case, the Royal Rumble is the main event, but every championship match Brett had just about were the best match his opponent had yeah. in WWF. <laughs> Diesel, that was the best one. Sean Waltman, uh, you know, that match was incredible. And now look at Brett. And look at look at Helen over there. Her mother going, oh, geez. And Brett's he's trying to crawl. Look at that, pulling himself up by Ramon's tights while Ramon's slapping him in the head. That's heel body language and attitude. And you want you feel bad for the baby face that's there has been had the shit kicked out of him like that and it still has the guts to try to pull himself up and get back in the fight. And boom, and he's slick and he's resourceful and haul for a second there didn't realize exactly what was going on. <laughs> and he got a false finish out of nowhere. And now look, he's trying to trap that sharpshooter with the legs on the mat already, rolls over. And boom, he's about to get it. And now Hall's in a bad way again. Hall, Razor, Scott, Ramon, what? And boom, and there it was, just that quick. Before it the tap out. It wasn't out of nowhere. Yeah, and that's the thing. Before then, that's one of the reasons why they thought they could get away with it in Montreal, because the, there wasn't a tap out. It was a nod of the head or a ver verbal I quit. But see, that came suddenly, but it didn't just come out of nowhere and make no sense. Brett finally got his hold that he'd been working for, and it worked, but it took everything he could, t he could do to get it. And Razor Ramon gave him everything and more that he could take, and he almost had him, but boom, the more experienced, resourceful babyface wins out here. What a fucking match. And it, it's... It's not like that they reinvented the wheel there, but again, everything made sense, and each guy only did shit that that guy would do if they were who they were purported to be in real life. And, you know, when you think back to this time, this was really a down period for WWF. This is coming off the year of the steroid trial, or not even a steroid trial, the steroid allegations yeah. before the steroid trial, the uh, ring boy allegations, all these different things. Crowds were down. Meanwhile, look at the crowd and how they're reacting. I haven't seen this in a while. I didn't remember just how into it the fans there were. Well, that's, again, when you go back and... I noticed it. Oh, God. <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> I kept oh, it running. It appears that there's a uh, fake Bill Clinton walking through the uh, crowd. Yeah. Oh, I remember the fake Bill Clinton. I think that's oh, who God. it was. I don't even know. Well, let's pause it now anyway. Um, you know, that's that's a thing is I noticed it, God, in the early 2000s. I was in OVW a lot, and our fans reacted the way that wrestling fans always reacted. It could have been the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, whatever. But when I started going to Ring of Honor shows and or other independent shows, I noticed that the fans were even quieter than they had been. The 90s, it started that way, and they'd get up for the top guys of the big stuff, and the WWF fans were always a bit more quiet than the NWA fans, even during the matches. But I noticed the whole atmosphere changed, not only from people not being as excited to people not being as into whatever was going on, but also 
I mean, when I first started going to live matches in the 70s, when I started the business in the 80s, if it was a really rotten preliminary match, sometimes you would hear a house show crowd not really making any noise. Otherwise, no matter what the match was or what was going on, people were screaming constantly. And they would really scream and make noise if it was something really big going on. But, I mean, arm drags and drop kicks would get responses that now it's, it's you know, when Punk's first strains of his music hits, that type of response. And we've, we've lost that because we got so far afield, lost the plot, made shit so much further out that nobody could believe it or take it seriously then made the bumps so ludicrous that we know they can't be real or nobody'd be alive and the guys at the same time stopped being serious about their opponents because they were oh I'm, everybody knows now so i've got to be an entertainer i can't act like i'm really serious and really like that because people will think i'm really a dick and so now it's just something to watch while guys slowly destroy their bodies for no reason. And, uh, and we don't get matches like these anymore where the people jump up and down and everybody's still safe and in one piece. But that was a Scott Hall, a razor Ramon watch along and a glimpse back into history at what, the business used to look like before we let the wrong people in it. Hopefully everybody enjoyed it. I think they did. I didn't know you were looking for my uh, certification. I wasn't looking for it, but I was hoping that it would, it would jump in. <laughs> that was fantastic. And, you know, speaking of jumping in, after a while, I didn't even want to jump in. You're incredible. Going through that match, you break it down in such a, not just entertaining way, but a helpful way, I think, for a lot of, a lot of the people in the business. Well, and I don't, I really, I didn't, I didn't think that because I thought I'm just seeing what everybody else with eyes can see. Anybody can see this. I don't know why people can't emulate it or understand the psychology of it. It's obvious, but if you liked it, that's all that matters, young man. Well, thank you very much, old man. Hey, all right. Are we timed? Is it time to go? Are we timed? We're timed. Are, we're timed? We, we are timed. Wait. wait. <laughs> <laughs> Have we got there yet? Okay. We're there. Uh, we're there. And folks, remember, if you go to jimcornette.com, on the home page, there are banners of the new action figures, the new designs, the Jim Cornette commentator playset, and the Jim Cornette bloody variant, now with tennis racket as well as the commentator playset coming with the microphones and the headsets and the announce desk in a display box. You can see pictures of all that stuff. They go on sale Saturday, April 2nd at noon. We will be back with the drive through in, in a few days and next week here on the experience with more of this. And uh, by next week, I'll figure out what I'm talking about. What do you think, Brian? Should we know going in or is it better this way? I think it's healthy every now and then, and who knows how often, to do these potpourri shows. Well, you bring the po, and I'll bring the pourri. Until next week, folks, thank you, fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody.